time in the city. Give me a host. My hair plugs ain't pretty. Hot times in the city. I'm feeling kinda Welcome to the mop-up, to our very special January 6 viewing party edition of the mop-up for July 21st, 2022. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is killing me and I have no air conditioner. Well, Joe Biden was looking for some positive news and he got some today. He tested positive for COVID. The White House says the president is working in isolation, so it's pretty much business as usual. It's not like Biden's going to get on Air Force One and fly down to West Virginia to take on Joe Manchin. No, he announced his big executive order on climate change this week in Massachusetts. Really brave, Joe, going into enemy territory when it comes to climate change. Massachusetts. I hope he won over the voters in Massachusetts when it comes to climate change. No, you announce your executive order in West Virginia or in Arizona, where cinema is from. You go to West Virginia to challenge Joe Manchin, or you, you go to Arizona, where cinema is, where, and they're feeling the, the record heat in Arizona and Massachusetts. Well, Biden tested positive this morning, and he's taking the antiviral drug Paxlovid, which is an emergency release made possible by the Food and Drug Administration. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, the trial of Steve Bannon is continuing this week. He uh, faces misdemeanor contempt of Congress charges after he ignored a subpoena to appear before the January 6th committee. The January 6th committee wants to know what Bannon was planning the night before the insurrection over at the Willard Hotel, which is right next door to the White House. They subpoenaed Steve Bannon so he would tell the committee what exactly he meant when he said to his podcast listeners this on January 5th. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. What what do you think he meant by that? It was January 5th. He was talking to his podcast listeners and he said the night before what 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 did he all hell is going to break loose tomorrow gee i wonder what he was talking about maybe he was talking about the chili cheesesteak he ate and (laughs) was worried about what he was going to do to the bathroom or maybe it was the january 6 riot well his defense he's on trial this week the defense rested without bannon ever taking the stand bannon pleaded not guilty if convicted steve bannon would face a minimum of 30 days in prison on tuesday speaking of all hell breaking loose chipotle did i pronounce it properly chipotle or chipotle or whatever chipotle chipotle closed the first restaurant in its chain to go union last month workers in an augusta maine chipotle filed with the national labor relations board saying they have voted to unionize chipotle responded by closing down the restaurant chipotle union organizer brandy mcneese said in a statement quote this is union busting 101 and there is nothing that motivates us to fight harder than this underhanded attempt to shut down the labor movement within their stores. Chipotle, she went on to say, is scared because they know how powerful we are. And if we, we catch fire like the unionization effort over at Starbucks, they won't be able to stop us. Well, Starbucks is closing stores and they're firing union organizers and they're refusing despite what the law says Starbucks is refusing to negotiate 
with the Starbucks union, the same way Jeff Bezos over at Amazon is refusing to negotiate with Christian Smalls and the Amazon labor union. They don't obey the laws of America. By law, Starbucks, Chipotle, and Amazon have to negotiate with the workers, but they don't they are immune to our taxation laws and our labor laws. Julian Assange is not immune to American law. He awaits extradition to the United States on 17 charges of violating a more than 100 year old law called the Espionage Act. A judge in Great Britain recently ruled that Assange must be turned over to American authorities, but lawyers for Assange now say they will submit yet another appeal to the British courts in late August. In Britain, Prime Minister Boris Johnson said goodbye. Here is his farewell message. We've helped, I've helped to get this country through a pandemic and help save another country from barbarism. And frankly, that's enough to be going on with. Mission largely accomplished for now. Wow, he, uh, he said he accomplished a lot as prime minister. He said that he helped Great Britain stave off the COVID infection, and he saved Ukraine. Mission mostly, mission mostly accomplished. Where have I heard that before? What other fool said that? I can't remember. I think I heard somebody else as dangerous as Boris Yeltsin saying, mission accomplished. I, I don't remember where. Well, here is Boris's last lesson that he wanted to impart to his fellow parliamentarians. This is, this is the message that Boris Johnson wants to leave us with. Remember, remember a bubble. It's not Twitter that counts. It's the people that sent us here. It's not Twitter that counts. It's uh, the people who sent us to the parliament. Not most Brits, just the people uh, we're beholden to. Well, I guess uh, that's the big news coming out of Great Britain. Nothing else to report. Uh, about great, oh, hang on, late breaking news. Some breaking news now. Sky News understands uh, the RAF has halted flights in and out of RAF Bryce and Autumn because the runway has melted in this extreme weather. Hmm. Uh, I guess uh, he didn't say anything about climate change when he said goodbye. The runway is melting. Well, who cares? That's that's Great Britain. I can't help it if they can't get their shit together when it comes to climate change. That's, you know, that's Great Britain. We got it together here in the United States. Dallas, Oklahoma City and Tulsa all approaching 110 degrees in the days ahead. Doctors and public officials urging caution tonight, urging Americans to stay inside if possible, to stay cool, and of course, hydrate. Make sure you're drinking water. Power grids under stress, an anxious eye on Texas, of course, after what happened there before. And here in New York tonight, Con Ed sending alerts to customers to conserve power. Wow, okay. <laughs> the January 6th committee is holding hearings tonight starting at 8 p.m. So we're gonna do the show live in our Zoom room and on YouTube. Then we will stop recording, watch the hearings together. We're gonna have a viewing party in our Zoom room. And then we will hit the record button, go live once again on YouTube and talk about what we just saw with the Reverend Barry W. Lynn from Americans United for Separation of Church and State, Alan Minsky, Executive Director of Progressive Democrats of America, and the professors in Marianne, Professor Marianne Cummings, Professor Jonathan Bick, and Professor Ann Lee. And then I will take your calls to hear what you think about tonight's hearings. If you're watching us right now live on YouTube, I'm gonna shut down the YouTube feed once the hearings start at 8 p.m. and the watch party will be in our Zoom room, our virtual studio audience. And if you'd like to join us in our virtual studio audience for the watch party, please go to davidfeldmanshow.com, hit the pay-per-view button, 
and it will give you the link to join us in the Zoom room. It says pay-per-view, it's free. We just call it pay-per-view. We just use the pay-per-view button and you can watch with us and join the conversation afterwards. After the hearings, we will go live again on YouTube for our wrap up. Most of the people hearing this right now are my podcast listeners and this has nothing to do with you. You will get your normal full show at 3 a.m. Eastern on Friday. Just know that three hours into the show is when we begin our wrap up of the January 6th hearing scheduled for tonight at 8 p.m. But if you're listening to this, that would be yesterday uh, at 8 p.m. Lots and lots and lots to get to today. Of course, the deadly heat waves, climate change, abortion, guns, and January 6th. A lot of focus, of course, on the hearings. But what about Merrick Garland over at the Justice Department? Well, yesterday, Merrick Garland was giving a press conference, and he was asked whether or not he was willing to prosecute Donald Trump. Here's what he said. You got to listen. It's a little low. Look, no person is above the law in this country. No, no person is above the law in this country. So in other words, he's not going to prosecute Donald Trump. Look, he's got to go before a jury and convict Donald Trump. 70, what, 75 million people voted for this clown. Half the jury has to, if you're going to pick a jury, half that jury has to have voted for Trump. I just don't see how you get a conviction. I, 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 I just don't see how it's possible. Well, on Wednesday, the Senate Judiciary Committee held hearings to mark up their 2021 assault weapons ban. They're going to try to bring back the assault weapons ban. I guess some stuff has been happening that concerns them. And they're also going to try to pass the Equal Access for Victims of Gun Violence Act. David Hogg, founder of March for Our Lives and a survivor of the shooting in Parkland four years ago, he interrupted a House committee that was also holding hearings on the assault weapons ban. Hogg shouted at Republican Congressman Andy Biggs, who claimed instead of an assault weapons ban, we need Americans to be armed against an invasion along the southern border. David Hogg screamed at him, quote, the shooter at my high school was anti-Semitic, anti-Black and racist. The shooter in El Paso described it as an invasion. What Hogg meant by it, he was referring to the 2019 shooting at a Texas Walmart. Uh, Hogg went on to say those guns are coming from the United States of America. They aren't coming from Mexico. You are there, are you are reiterating the points of a mass shooter, sir. Hogg was forcibly removed from the hearing by Capitol Police. Well, back in the Senate, here is what Senator Tammy Duckworth had to say about the assault weapons ban. I refuse to do nothing in the face of a deadly epidemic of gun violence that is now the leading cause of death of young Americans. Let me say that now. The leading cause of death of Americans under the age of 16 in this country isn't cancer, isn't car accidents, it's gun violence. Only in America. Only in America. That's Senator Tammy Duckworth, a Democrat who served in Iraq where she lost both her legs. She represents Illinois where a mass shooting took place on July 4th in Highland Park. Seven people were shot to death. Nancy Rodering is the mayor of Highland Park, and here's what she told the committee yesterday. And the most disturbing part, this is the norm in our country. Highland Park had the uniquely American experience of a 4th of July parade turn into what has now become a uniquely American experience of a mass shooting. How do we call this freedom? Other advanced nations live free of fear, gun, free of, fear of gun violence, and we know that mental health issues exist everywhere in our world. American mayors, and I've talked to several in these past few weeks, fear not if, but when a mass shooting is going to hit our towns. What's different about the U.S.? The U.S. has civilian access to assault weapons and large capacity magazines. That is the only differentiating factor. In 2013, in the wake of Sandy Hook, we as a city banned assault weapons and large capacity magazines. We knew that a federal ban would be the most effective, but
but a local ban reflecting the values of our community was our only option under the law. Local governments cannot do this alone. Congress must take action. You must federally ban assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Today is the day to start saving lives. Thank you. Yeah, if you live in Illinois, you depend on the federal government to stop the flow of assault weapons and guns coming into your state. You can pass gun laws in Highland Park, but you're right next door to Indiana, where on July 1st, they said anybody can carry a concealed weapons. This isn't a state's rights issue. This is the federal government. The federal government has to step in and uh, do something about this. I love what she said. You call this freedom? They're so busy talking you know, about the Second Amendment. People keep talking about their freedoms. Well, the rest of us have zero freedom because of their obsession with guns. Abortion, Judge Clarence Thomas made it clear that the court isn't stopping with Roe v. Wade. He wants to go after gay marriage, even gay sex and contraception. The Democrats were accused of being asleep at the switch for never bothering to codify a woman's right to abortion as a law, a law that could not be overturned by right-wing extremist judges sitting on the Supreme Court. A week ago, the House passed two bills that would guarantee a woman's right to an abortion as well as her right to travel across state lines to get that abortion. It passed, but it passed pretty much along party lines. Republicans would not vote for it, which means a bill legalizing abortion will not get the 60 votes needed to overcome a filibuster in the Senate. This week, Nancy Pelosi's House passed a law legalizing gay marriage. Stefanik, a few Republicans, Liz Cheney, uh, voted in favor of that. They passed another law in the House legalizing contraception. This is how far back this Supreme Court, this Republican Party wants to take us. They want to overturn Griswold from the 60s and take away our, our right to buy contraception. Today, the House passed a law that would enshrine both a man and a woman's right to use contraception well, you would think that would pass overwhelmingly. No, 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 228 to 195. 195 Republicans voted against contraception. Here's Congresswoman Angie Craig. She is a Democrat from the great state of Minneapolis. Here's Congresswoman Angie Craig. It's really about rolling back our rights, the rights of American women. I am disheartened. I am disappointed. And quite frankly, I'm appalled that we have to vote on this damn bill at all. First, they voted against codifying Roe. Then 77% of them, don't give the 47 credit, 77% of them yesterday voted against allowing my family and I to continue to exist as a family. This is not an extremist issue. This is an extremist GOP. They have turned into an extremist party, a radical party that is opposed to everything that my constituents value, freedom and liberty and their own rights. This is great politics on behalf of Nancy Pelosi, this is great politics because she's forcing the Republican Party's hands. You know, we take it for granted that everybody wants contraception. We take it for granted that everybody is in favor of gay marriage. Everybody's in favor of gay sex. We took it for granted that, well, not everybody's in favor of abortion, but the Republicans, it was just a fundraising ploy. They weren't really trying to get rid of abortion. This is brilliant. You know, I don't like Nancy Pelosi, but this is a brilliant move to force the Republican hand on contraception, gay marriage, gay sex, and of course, abortion. Here's the frightening thing. 
we needed the courts in America to give us freedom to use contraception, freedom for an abortion. We needed the courts to give us freedom for gay marriage, freedom for interracial marriage, loving versus Virginia, and freedom uh, for gay sex. That was never in, enshrined in the federal laws. Why? I don't think that stuff could have could have passed for whatever reason. And now we're going to find that with a Democrat in the White House, the Democrats controlling the House and the Democrats barely controlling a, a Senate that is, you know, vulnerable to the filibuster, we're going to discover that in America, in America, we cannot pass these basic human rights. What is it? It's you know, a lot of people will say it's our system, the Electoral College. They'll say it's New York only getting two senators, the same as Wyoming. I understand that. Uh, but these issues, contraception, abortion, gay marriage, gay sex, these should be slam dunks, even with the structural disadvantages we have. Uh, it, it's very disheartening. It's not going to get passed. They're not going to codify, enshrine into our law the right to contraception, the right to an abortion, or the right to gay marriage. It's not going to happen. The Republicans are going to veto, or are going to filibuster these bills. Good politics on behalf of Nancy Pelosi. The, the, the new polling is showing that in a generic survey, the Democrats are keeping the House. In a generic survey that doesn't factor in filibustering and the democrats are out fundraising the republicans so you know uh if you're worried about the democratic party uh you know this is smart politics this is smart politics republican congresswoman from florida kat kamak uh, voted against uh, the contraception bill here's what she said this bill, the Right to Deception Act, is looking to solve a problem that doesn't exist. But more than that, in seeking to solve a problem that doesn't exist, you want to spend more of our taxpayer money to grow the size and scope of government and to allow more abortions to occur and kill our children. Cool. Y'all are a real piece of work. Folks back home, they see right through this, and they'll see through it in November. I urge opposition to this bill, and I yield the remainder of my time. Yeah, there are structural disadvantages. Most people do want contraception but because of gerrymandering in florida you end up with a congresswoman like kat kamik uh anyway all of this is overwhelming because the deplorables seem to be winning and who are the deplorables the richest one percent not the same deplorables hillary was talking about the real deplorables are the richest one percent who control our government they control our government by manipulating the insane, like, you know, Congresswoman Kat Kamek, she's insane. They manipulate the undereducated, like Florida Congresswoman Kat Kamek, uh, the sexually frustrated. Oh, I think that would be Kat Kamek. I don't think contraception is an issue for her. Okay, that 20 years ago, I could have said something like that, but now I can't. That, that would be wrong. Uh, they manipulate the gun-worshipping, superstitious buffoons who prefer religion, who choose hatred and discrimination over a functioning government that works for everyone. What the richest 1% doesn't want us to realize is only government can solve our problems. Let me repeat only government can solve our problems period and what we are witnessing right now in america is the apotheosis of a 50-year war against government in an attempt to take over government they demon these people the one percent demonized government said it was evil and while they were doing that they took over the reins of power. The very government they call evil, they now own. So what we're feeling right now, this demoralization, all of this, the heat, the mass shootings, the threat to what's left of our republic, it's all because the richest 1% 
staged a slow motion coup d'etat and took over that evil government. The rich tell us government is the enemy, but they don't believe that. They are all for government. They can't exist. The rich cannot exist without government. For example, the Senate this week passed a bill that would provide $52 billion in subsidies to chip makers, to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is getting $52 billion from the federal government. We won't get any ownership, right? We're, we're just going to give money to Intel, NVIDIA. We're just going to give them money and no ownership, no ownership, no stock ownership. Here's $52 billion. It's not even discussed. The idea of our giving the, these chip manufacturers $52 billion and not getting any shares in the business is out of the question. That would be socialism. Socialism for us, not socialism. Just, you know, if you give them $52 billion and don't ask for anything in return, that's just socialism for corporate America and the wealthiest 1%. So there's no problem with that kind of socialism. Uh, the chip companies are getting $52 billion of our tax dollars. It passed in the Senate 64 to 34. So that means it has a, it has a filibuster-proof majority. It's bipartisan. The Republicans are on board because they claim... This is how they justify it. It's about national security. They're worried that the Defense Department uh, is purchasing semiconductor chips from, uh, from China. So it's dangerous. So 52, 54, 55 billion dollars uh, for Silicon Valley, for the chip makers, plenty of money. Uh, and, and by the way, this isn't a bailout. It's not like Intel or Nvidium is needs help like they're going out of business intel nvidia uh and they're getting like a huge chunk of this money uh they're doing just fine uh but the federal government is giving them 52 billion dollars just to encourage them to keep their factories here in america you know, there are other ways to encourage Intel to keep factories here in America through taxation by actually they're giving us, instead of our giving them $52 billion to stay in America, uh, we tax them if they don't stay in America. That's how normal, rational societies operate. Meanwhile, scientists say a more contagious wave of COVID is hitting America and could end up uh, infecting 100 million of us but the senate can't seem to pass a 10 billion dollar covid relief bill that would provide for free testing as well as making vaccines and therapeutics readily available if not free maybe affordable so we have money for intel and nvidium no money for americans uh so they go and get tested and uh, get vaccinated. No money for that. 60 billion in weapons for Ukraine though, and counting. Ukraine's first lady, Elena Zelenska, addressed members of Congress this week. Unprecedented. Never before has the first lady of another country spoken before Congress. She spoke before members of Congress warning of a humanitarian disaster facing her country. Well, a humanitarian disaster. And what is her solution? Weapons. You know, it's the same identical humanitarian disaster facing Yemen, which has been caused by weapons, American weapons. But meanwhile, Joe Biden was off in Saudi Arabia last week making nice, no mention of Yemen, no concern about the, the largest cholera epidemic on the planet caused by the Saudi Arabians in Yemen? No, just pump more oil. That's all he asked of the Saudi Arabians. And now there's a humanitarian disaster in Ukraine. Five, six million refugees. Ukraine not doing well. Putin doubling down in the south uh, is probably going to do to the separatist uh, territory what he did with Crimea and just declare it Russian. But the solution, 
more weapons. And the, the first lady of Ukraine spoke before Congress and had their ear because she was asking for weapons. She wasn't asking for food or medicine. She was asking for weapons. When's the last time Reverend Barber from the Poor People's Campaign addressed Congress? We're giving weapons to Ukraine with no strings attached, no inspector general, no accountability. But here in America, you want food stamps? You want welfare? Well, you want welfare? Have you looked for work this week? Let me see your bank statements to make sure you're not ripping off our government. Money for the chip makers, 52 billion for Intel and NVIDIA, money for weapons, 60, 70 billion dollars for Ukraine, no money for COVID, no money for COVID here in the United States, where they say 250,000 more Americans will die in the next two years. No money for our schools, Look, the government of the United States is not dysfunctional. It is working perfectly, just not for us. It works if you're a chip maker, if you own stock in, in NVIDIA or Intel, or if you own stock in the Carlyle Group, like David Rubenstein, it's working swell. This is the most efficient government in the history of civilization if you're part of the richest one percent for the past 50 years the richest one percent have rebuilt government in their own image uh, now not to belabor the point but right before this big vote on the 52, 53 dollar, 50 52 to 53 billion dollar bailout for Silicon Valley for the trip manufacturers, our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, Democrat, purchased as much as five million dollars in Nvidia stock. Nvidia is a chip maker. They're going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of the 52 billion dollar bailout for chip makers. And she went ahead and took her cut. She bought $5 million in NVIDIA stock. She says she didn't buy the stock, her husband did. And she says, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, nothing wrong with that. I would expect that from the Republicans maybe but from the Democrats who are supposed to speak for labor, for tax paying American citizens to protect us from corporate corruption, uh, I, I would expect our leaders in the Democratic Party not to have $5 million to play the stock market with. I, would, I expect people who speak for me not to have that kind of money. Go join the Republican Party. So government, government isn't in trouble. Government isn't going anywhere. Democracy is, a republic is, uh, you and I are, but government is doing just fine because it is controlled by Wall Street and corporate America and the richest families. Government is stronger than ever but government is governing the people instead of the other way around. The people who control our government, the people who control our government don't live in America. They have mega yachts, private jets, homes all over the world and soon outer space. Paul Pelosi has two wineries in the Napa Valley that we know of, and that's not America. The police, private security protect him. They do not live in America. They, the Pelosi's, the Biden's, and their idiot children live in these bubbles of privilege. And they simply cannot imagine what it's like to lose your home to climate change or lose your home to eviction or lose the car you're sleeping in because the police were ordered by 
Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles to clear out the homeless and they seized the car you and your family were sleeping in because there are so many bench warrants associated with your car that it's now government property. They cannot imagine living that way. So let me make this crystal clear. There is no alternative to government. As Professor Mary Ann Cummings, particle physicist and Parks Commissioner of Aurora, Illinois, Aurora, Illinois she was elected to that position. Uh, big Bernie supporter, Professor Mary Ann Cummings will be joining us later. On the show, I think Monday, she said, we're going to have a government whether you like it or not. There's going to be a government. Right now, we don't like it, but we have a government. Stop buying into the corporate propaganda that government is dysfunctional. Government is working perfectly. The oil companies are posting record profits and it's earnings seasons right now on Wall Street. Pay attention, pay attention to, to the earnings. You know, inflation, they keep talking about, oh, their inflation is killing us. Corporate America's profit margins are doing just fine. The stock market was up, I think, 700 points yesterday. Uh, most of the companies reporting earnings are doing exceptionally well because the government, this dysfunctional government, works perfectly for the stock market. It works perfectly if you have $5 million, like Paul Pelosi, to put into Novidium. The government works for the bankers, the landlords, like the Pelosi's, their landlords. The government works for our richest one percent. Now, Wall Street won't stop talking about a recession that's right around the corner. They keep saying, kind of like, you know, remember how Biden was saying Putin's going to attack Ukraine? There's nothing we can do about it. There's not, And you thought, you know, it's almost as though Biden wants Putin to invade Ukraine, which he did, because he could have stopped it. Uh, but he didn't. He wanted to get Putin stuck in a quagmire like Afghanistan or Vietnam. So he just kept saying, Putin's going to invade, no doubt about it. And sure enough, eventually Putin invaded. And right now, Wall Street keeps going, there's going to be a recession, no doubt about it. There's, going to be, there's a recession, it's just around the corner. Why? They play dumb, like it's inevitable that there's going to be a recession. They know there's going to be a recession because Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve is trying to jump start a recession by hiking interest rates. They want a recession. The richest 1% want a recession because that will drive down the cost of labor. When you hike up interest rates, you raise borrowing costs, which means people can't buy homes because they can't borrow money. But if you have cash, like the richest one percent you don't what do you care about mortgage rates the price of a home goes down you have all this cash sitting around what do you care what a mortgage costs if you have 200 million dollars in cash you want the, the you want home prices to go down your Jerome Powell is doing the work of the richest one percent who are all sitting on cash right now they all sold that we're in a bear market, which means hedge fund managers, the richest 1% who invest, they pulled out of the stock market. This is a bear market, it's down 20%, which means the 1% have cash. You know, they sell their stock, right? Now they have cash. Jerome Powell raises interest rates. Nobody can afford to buy a house because they need a mortgage. But the people who don't need a mortgage, like Paul Pelosi, the people who have five million dollars sitting around, like vultures, they sweep in and they buy all this property on the cheap. That's what Jerome Powell is doing by raising interest rates. And they they say 
that when Jerome Powell raises interest rates, he raises borrowing costs, which hits the consumer because it becomes, it costs too much to put things on your credit card. It costs, suddenly when Jerome Powell raises interest rates, our credit cards get too expensive. So I wanna talk about credit cards for a second. How is it possible that it could, how is it possible, it, how could it possibly cost more to put something on my credit card? I don't see how that's possible. There is cheap money out there, or there was cheap money out there, but it wasn't for the consumers, not your credit card. The credit card companies lend money like the Gambino family, usurious interest rates. Rates, by the way, that our Christian evangelical friends should be talking about. This is something the religious right should be up in arms against. They should be going after the credit card companies because usurious interest rates are strictly prohibited by the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is anti-Judeo-Christian Ezekiel. This is from Ezekiel. If he lends at interest and takes profit, shall he then live? No, he shall not live. Old Testament. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. That's Ezekiel. This is Deuteronomy. This is Old Testament. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother. By brother, it means your, your fellow countrymen. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, your fellow countrymen. Interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest, right? Your credit card company makes you borrow money to pay off interest. That's a sin according, making somebody do that, that's a sin according to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says you may charge a foreigner interest, that means from another country, but you may not charge a fellow countryman interest. Leviticus, you shall not lend him your money at interest nor give him your food for profit. You're not allowed to sell food at above cost. Leviticus. Exodus, this is God talking, Old Testament God. I'll get to New Testament God. I'll get to Jesus in a second. Exodus, if you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not act like a money lender to them, and you shall not exact interest from them. God is saying you can lend money, but you can't be a money lender. You can't collect interest. If you ever take your neighbor's coat as collateral for a loan, you shall return it to him immediately before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering, and it is his only covering for his body, so how else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will know what you have done to him, for I, unlike you, am compassionate. This is some heavy shit from God to the credit card companies. Matthew, now we're talking Jesus. This is what Jesus said. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Jesus goes on to say, you cannot serve God and money. The credit card companies are godless. Uh, but somehow, our Christian nationalists who rule over the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, uh, they have no problem with the money lenders who have free reign in this country. The money lenders have free reign in this country. You know, Giuliani got rid of the mafia in the 80s, and we just replaced the mafia with the banks. And I'm being serious about this. The banks lend money just like mobsters, exactly like mobsters. So, you know, with Jerome Powell over at the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, 
I simply do not see how his raising interest rates, I just don't see how the credit card companies could possibly raise my interest rates more than they already have. Uh, you know, for a couple of months, I talked about this last, about two weeks ago, I found that I had a, an old credit card and I had left $700 on it and I forgot about it. By the time I realized that I left $700 on the, this credit card, uh, the debt pretty much doubled and then some. And we're not talking about years, we're talking about months that it doubled. I think the credit card debt they were charging me was something like 30% a year. And I looked into this, the debt is added on each month. So you're paying 30% interest on the interest plus fees. In other words, let's say you owe $700, they, is it called am amortizing? I don't know, but they charge you interest every month. So they, so if you owe $700, uh, the next month you owe something like $750, plus there's a $50 fee. So now you owe $800. And now you have to pay interest on the interest that was tacked on Plus you have to pay interest on the $50 fee that they tack on. So you no longer owe $700, you owe $800. And then each month they just keep tacking on interest and more fees. And within months, that $700 turns into $1,400. So I called Visa and the, the woman on the phone could not explain to me how it doubled within months. She could not do the math. I, I made her, I kept her on the line and, and, and she wanted to transfer me to a, a supervisor. I said, no, I wanna know what you know. You're supposed to be able to help me here. Do the math. Uh, and I, I kind of, you know, politely demanded that she do her job and explain the interest charges and the fees and how $700 becomes $1,500 in a matter of months. And I kept her on the phone for about an hour. I ended up liking her and we have an email. We're going back and forth in email. Uh, she admitted over the phone during a conversation that we both knew Visa is recording, you know, to enhance customer service by making sure the customer service rep never spills the beans on what a racket, what a usurious racket the credit card industry is. So we both knew it was being taped, but she politely explained to me that over the phone that they really don't teach us how to calculate the interest for the customers and we don't really understand the fees. And then she contacted me. She knew my name. She looked me up and she contacted me through my website. And we've been going back and forth anonymously. And she said to me that she is a first generation American who went to college. This is the only job she can get. She said Visa doesn't train their customer service people on how to calculate the fees and interest or the rates and the or the charges that they're discouraged from explaining to the customers why they owe what they owe. She said in an email to me, when you, when she, when you call her, uh, she is incapable of providing information on how to reduce your, pe your payments or your debt, because that's not what Visa wants. They don't want you to pay off your debt. She admitted that she doesn't understand the nomenclature, these terms like APR, that it's all too complicated for her. And then she said in another email, she's dealing with tons of single moms who are putting medical bills on their credit cards and they can't pay these medical bills back. And the debt for these medical bills, you know, double every couple of months. And here's the thing, I looked into this, it's all perfectly legal because the government works fine. The government is not dysfunctional. 
it's working perfectly fine for the banks and the lenders. We even have a president from Delaware, which is the credit card capital of the world. The government is working just fine. You will not hear President Joe Biden talk about reining in, reining in credit cards. No way. Now, here's something that blew me away, and I had no idea. The federal government has absolutely no limits on interest rates a credit card company can charge. Zero. Zero. The federal government does not put a cap on the interest rates a credit card company can charge its customers. So whatever Jerome Powell is doing with interest rates, the credit card companies couldn't give a shit. They make their own rules because it's left to the individual states. It's up to the individual states to decide whether or not there's going to be a cap on interest rates. Uh, now, usury laws are complicated on purpose because it's up to the states, you know, states, right? States' rights, right? States' rights. Some states place limits on how high the interest rates can be on borrowed money. But these laws mean nothing. They mean nothing. Most states have some kind of usury law, some kind of cap on interest rates. But I think they're called adhesion contracts. When you sign up for a credit card, there are terms of service that you never read, but you just click on them because you need the money, you need a credit card. So when you sign up for a credit card, when you click, when you agree on the terms of service, you sign away the bank's responsibility to obey those usury laws. When you sign up, Again, you don't read the, ter the TOS, the terms of service. You just click yes. And once you click yes, all usury laws no longer apply. Poof, they disappear. You also lose the right to sue the credit card company. It has to go into arbitration. And guess who picks the mediator? The credit card companies. Uh, so the government, the federal government, has no caps on what a credit card company, the federal government has no caps on what a credit card company can charge in terms of interest rates. They leave it to the states to outlaw loan sharks, but it's all performative. It has the appearance of local government looking out for the lender, but that's a lie. It's a lie. There is no law to prevent lenders from making the terms of the loan predicated on the borrower's promise, the borrower's promise to waive their right to these caps that rein in the cost of borrowing. There are no laws that say you can't issue a credit card with a terms of service uh, that uh, waves away usury laws. So the government makes it look like they're protecting borrowers. But when you agree to a credit card, you can't get that credit card unless you waive your rights to government protection. You have no protection when you get a credit card. There are laws on the books that appear to protect you. But in order to get those credit cards, you have to sign away your right to those laws. In South Dakota, there are pretty much no limits on how much interest a credit card company can charge you. Now, if you owe below $5,000 on your credit card in South Dakota, theoretically, in South Dakota, the credit card company is only allowed to charge you 12% a year. But you waived away that cap when you signed up for the credit card. Uh, and after $5,000, according to South Dakota law, there is absolutely no limit on what Visa can charge you in its interest. No limit. 
no limit whatsoever. Uh, now, we talk a lot about Wall Street, but the truth is most banks, most credit card lenders have moved their operations into states like South Dakota that have no usury laws. Look and see where your credit card has been issued. Mine come from South Dakota, where there are no usury laws. Robert Manning, author of Credit Card Nation, writes that because of states' rights, because there is no federal usury law, no federal caps on interest rates, a bank, a lender, can move their headquarters to a quote-unquote lender-friendly state like South Dakota and export the interest rate of that state to any customer. So if you are borrowing from South Dakota, a bank in South Dakota, they can jack up the interest rates to whatever they want. It's why a $700 balance on my credit card within months became $1,500. Check your credit card, find out what state it was issued from. I guarantee you it wasn't issued in the state of New York. Something like 50% of credit card companies issue their cards from states that are not where their headquarters are located and they play fast and loose with the laws where they say, well, our company is headquartered here on Wall Street, but our credit card division is headquartered in South Dakota. Apple, for example, claims its headquarters are in Cupertino, California, but all its profits are collected in Reno, Nevada because of states' rights, uh, because the federal government doesn't issue protections, Apple pays no income tax in California. It is subject to the income tax in the state of Nevada, which is zero. So Apple pays zero state income tax. So Cupertino, California, where Apple is headquartered, supposedly Cupertino builds roads and schools for Apple and their, their children, the employees' children. But Apple pays zero in taxes to the city of Cupertino or to the state of California. And more importantly, there are no usury laws in Nevada. Why would there be? It's the gaming capital of the world, right? So Apple is sitting on $200 billion in cash, which is why they're now putting it on the street, you know, getting into the loan sharking business. When you agree to the terms of service for Apple Pay, you sign away any protection from usurious interest rates, and that card is issued, I'm pretty sure, out of Nevada. So there aren't any, any caps that Apple has to worry about. They can charge you whatever they want. So once again, you tell me whether government is working. Government is working just fine. It's just not working for you. As I talked about on Monday's show, neoliberalism is not about laissez-faire capitalism. It is not about getting government out of the way. We were led to believe that that's what corporate America wants, right? When Reagan began this 50-year war against government, he said government isn't the solution, government is the problem, but he didn't mean that. He just said that. Conservatives like Ronald Reagan, neoliberals like Bill Clinton, who echoed Ronald Reagan when during his inauguration, Bill Clinton, neoliberal Bill Clinton, said the age of big government is over. Uh, he didn't mean that. What he meant is government is over for you folk. It's going to get bigger for big business. And neoliberals always understood that government is the solution, right? Ronald Reagan famously said, government isn't the solution, government is the problem. Neoliberals and Reagan understood that government is the solution. The problem is democracy. Democracy is the problem.
That's what we have to remember. And we lose sight of this all the time. The problem for neoliberals is democracy, not government. Government isn't going anywhere. Democracy is. We're going to lose our democracy. We don't even, we're going to lose our republic. Democracy is the problem. As Professor Harvey J.K. has said on this show countless times, it was the Trilateral Commission in the 70s that set the stage for this war against democracy in favor of the richest 1%. It was the Trilateral Commission in the 70s. It was the Powell Memo. It was the Chamber of Commerce and the richest families in America who witnessed in the 60s and early 70s the rise of consumerism and environmentalism. And they said, we have a problem of too much democracy because people were having a say. And they said, hey, we need clean air, clean water. And that is not what the richest people in America want because it's too expensive. General Electric had, a, after the Clean Water Act of 72, uh, General Electric had to spend 20 years fighting the government uh, because they didn't want to clean up the forever chemicals, the PCBs out of the Hudson River. Uh, too much democracy. If you ask people to vote, they're going to say, yeah, I'd rather have clean water than higher profits for GE. So they launched a war against uh, democracy, not government. They invaded and then took over our government. And now they run it. Now they own it and it's working just fine. Government is not dysfunctional. Government is working. We lost the war for government. The richest 1% has won it. Labor has been decimated in the past 40 years. The rich don't pay taxes. They collect money from the government. They take from the government. They don't give to the government. The chip manufacturers are going to get $52 billion. The military industrial complex is getting $60 billion for Ukraine. You cannot pass a single piece of legislation in Washington unless it benefits the wealthiest 1%. We've talked about this study that was conducted about 10 years ago where they went through all the legislation that was successful coming out of Washington going back about 20 years. And they look to see whether or not the richest 1% supported that legislation. The study says, I think it came out of Princeton, or maybe it was Rutgers, I don't know, but it, I think it came out of New Jersey. The study concluded we're an oligarchy, that Congress will not pass any laws unless the oligarchs, the richest 1%, will approve them. You know, the infrastructure bill, bipartisan, that gets passed because the oligarchs approve it. The social safety net bill, never gonna get passed, right? That bipartisan infrastructure bill got passed last year, sailed through Congress, Biden signed it immediately because it was a love letter to oil, gas, the internet companies, but Bernie's social safety net bill, build back better, dead, 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 because that would put $2 trillion or more into the pockets of ordinary Americans by increasing the social safety net, making housing affordable, making education affordable, making health care affordable, prescription jugs, prescription jugs. Uh, I, because I wasn't breastfed as a child, uh, my pediatrician gave me, a, gave me prescription jugs. I don't want to get into it. Prescription drugs, Ordinary Americans, they don't get that $2 trillion. Bipartisan infrastructure bill, right? Any money that's going to corporations or the richest 1% have at it. Because our government has been taken over by the oligarchs, by the richest 1%. And this government, which works perfectly fine, is its mission 
is to uh, create precarity, not relieve it. This government wants us financially uh, in, a, in a state of financial precarity because labor is the enemy. The government has been waging a war against the working class since Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers. And at least the Republicans have the decency to pretty much admit it. You know, when they got rid of the COVID supplemental last year, I think it was Lindsey Graham who said, you know, if we keep paying Americans $600 a week, how are we going to get them to go back to work? We have to pretty much said we have to starve them out. We have to make them so hungry and terrified they'll work for slave wages. This government is run by the wealthy. They have taken it over. And the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6 knew that in their clogged hearts, they knew that. They couldn't articulate it because they've been brainwashed. They're simpletons who have been brainwashed into believing the, the source of all their immiseration. You know, it's the Mexicans, the Guatemalans, the blacks, the Jews, the lesbians, the Jews, the Arabs, the Hispanics, the Jews who are causing their financial precarity. That's, that's we all know this, that's, they're brainwashed. Well, the most dangerous people in America are the ones who can reach out to the people who sympathize with the insurrectionists. The most dangerous people in America, the most dangerous politicians in America are the ones who can talk to people who sympathize with the insurrectionists and say, put down your bear spray, put down your weapons. I understand your anger. Now look, I can't make you like Arabs, Jews, the LGBTQ. I can't make you like black people or women. But if you work with me, if you work with me, I can give you a livable wage, a semblance of job security union protections, clean water, clean air, a financial future, a savings account, an education, a good education for your children that's free. And I can give you roads that don't collapse, bridges that don't collapse. I can guarantee you vacation time and vacations that will be affordable because you'll be getting more money. Okay, now, I'm Jewish, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm a woman. And you know what? You can still hate me. You can still hate me. But come with me. Come with me on this. Come with me on this. Because I'm going to place a bet that if you, if you live in a community where you're not bombarded by the worry, the constant worry for your family's economic and physical security. I'm betting that you'll still hate me, but you won't act on your hatred for me. I'm going to bet that if your kids are going to a good school, I'm going to bet that if you're not saddled with debt, if you're not worried about the landlord evicting you or the bank kicking you off your land, I'm going to bet that the way I have sex isn't going to bother you all that much. I'm going to bet that you won't approve of it, but you're going to be too busy playing with your toys and your children to worry about which God I pray to. Because when people feel horrible, and that's the way the American people feel, they've been feeling this way longer than most of you realize, longer than most of my listeners realize, when people feel horrible, they have two choices. They can become paralyzed or they can lash out. 
And this is a problem that uh, our government uh, on both sides of the aisle is confronting. We have Americans who are angry and they know whose fault it is. They know whose fault it is. It is the fault of the people who sent all these charlatans to Washington, D.C. And the American people all know that. It is like uh, somebody has a big booger in their nose. The government has the big booger in their nose and we're all pretending we don't see it. It's like you get into a, a, an elevator at a fancy hotel and somebody farts and you just pretend you don't smell it. But everybody's thinking the same thing. This government stinks. If you're on the left, if you're on the right or on the middle, you know this government stinks because it works only for the richest 1% and they stink. So I don't approve, obviously, of the people who took the Capitol on January 6th or tried to take the Capitol. Uh, they have every right to be angry. They don't have a right, nobody has a right to resort to violence and they have no right to take it out on our government uh, unless it's through peaceful protest, through lobbying, and of course, voting and donating to the right candidates. The insurrectionists were angry. They have an enemy. They just don't know who it is. It's the weapons manufacturers. It's the chip makers. It's the banks. It's the inherited wealth. It's the people who want this government, who make this government, literally hand them money at the expense of ordinary Americans. This is what's going on, right? Intel, which is doing perfectly fine, is going to get billions of dollars in a handout from the government. Uh, and they don't pay taxes. These corporations, the rich, they do not pay taxes. They do not create jobs. And if they do, by accident, create a job, it pays shit and it's soul crushing. You know, uh, there's a myth in America of the entrepreneur. They love to uh, tell us that we're a nation of entrepreneurs. The truth is you cannot be an entrepreneur in this country without the mafia being your partner. And even when the mafia becomes your partner, you still fail. You just owe the mafia more money. And by mafia, I mean the money lenders, the banks. Uh, the banks uh, own your home. They own your business. They own your education. You cannot start a business in America without the banks getting a taste. And their taste is guaranteed. Their taste, depending on what kind of interest rates they're charging you, to, if it's a small business loan or a credit card loan, it all depends. They can be getting anywhere between 8 to 30% of your business. Depends on what kind of loan you got. These are mobsters. The Gambino family can't charge this much. So many of the insurrectionists on January 6 were people who bought into the lie that anyone can make it in America. They fan some of them fancied themselves entrepreneurs who believed Donald Trump's bullshit. But they were broke. They were in debt. But they identified with the richest 1% because they were brainwashed into thinking anyone can make it here in America. Right? Their anger comes from the fact that they couldn't articulate the realization that they, they are being robbed by the banks, that Trump University is a ripoff. There's no such thing as an entrepreneur because the system is rigged. Ashley Babbitt was killed by Capitol Police officers on January 6. She voted for Barack Obama. 
She also served in our military. She also bought into the American dream. And so she started her own pool business. But in order to start her own pool business and become an entrepreneur, you know, she was in the military. She got tired of taking orders. She wanted to be her own person. That's the promise that this country makes. So she started her own pool business, but she needed a partner. She needed the mafia to help her out. She took out a loan for her pool business. On July 1st, 2019, Ashley Babbitt was taken to court by the bank that lent her the money. And a judge ordered her to pay the bank $71,000. That's in you know, what she borrowed and then interest on what she borrowed and fees. And now she owes the bank $71,000. And her small business, her pool business, failed. In fewer than two years, Ashley Babbitt went from an Obama supporter to a Trump supporter to a QAnon follower. And by January 6, she was shot to death storming the Capitol. Fewer than two years that happens. Uh, on July 1st, 2019, right? That's when the bank ordered her to pay back the $71,000 loan on her failed pool business. She was a victim of the American lie and she couldn't square it in her head like so many of these insurrectionists they couldn't bring it to themselves admit to themselves that uh, they had been lied to uh, and they re they identify with the entrepreneurial class even though you can't be an entrepreneur in america without racking up massive debt americans it, it it's conceding defeat if you stop identifying with the entrepreneurial class, even though you failed, you failed. Your, your pool business failed, your $71,000 in debt, just to the bank on the business, God knows what the other credit card debt was. But if I identify with the working class, then I'm a loser, then I'm just a loser. So they, they, fought, they, they worship Donald Trump even more because the more I throw myself towards Donald Trump, the more of a winner I am. Uh, nobody tells the American people that you can't be an entrepreneur in America without racking up massive debt and going broke. 20% of all small businesses in America fail within the first year. That's according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. You have a one out of five chance of your business going under the first year. After five years of running your business, 50% of new businesses fail after five years. Looking at a 15 year horizon, one quarter of small businesses succeed after 15 years. If you're gonna go into your own business, you're gonna fail. Only one quarter of small businesses succeed after 15 years. Uh, if you're lucky as an entrepreneur, you paid yourself a salary, but you're going to rack up debt. You're going to declare bankruptcy. You're going to fail. You're going to take out more loans. You're going to borrow against whatever you have left. And you're going to be in debt for the rest of your life. But you're going to identify with the ruling class, you know, I'm going to identify with Donald Trump. That way, I'm not a loser. A lot of uh, college graduates who end up broke, uh, they can't break their, their love for arugula and fine wine. They still identify with that great college they paid for. But they're broke. But they won't identify with the working class because then that's conceding defeat. The same way with the insurrectionists, I'm going to identify with Donald Trump. Otherwise, I'm conceding defeat. I'm just a poor person who racked up massive debt. And Trump is perfect to identify with because he has spent his entire adult life in debt. Unlike Ashley Babbitt, he made it work. But the people who stormed the Capitol, 
like that real estate agent who bragged about flying on a private plane to get to the insurrection check her bank balances check her credit scores see how much money they actually have people who are solvent didn't storm the capital because they had too much capital to lose for example Steve Bannon is worth tens of millions of dollars Goldman Sachs believe it or not he has Seinfeld money I'm not making that up somehow Steve Bannon has Seinfeld money he invested in Seinfeld somehow uh he didn't storm the Capitol uh he was meeting at the Willard Hotel uh, the night before Willard Hotel right next door to the White House he was meeting with Giuliani uh, Mark Meadows the chief of staff for Trump phoned in on that meeting they were planning some kind of insurrection but they didn't dirty their hands by uh, marching with the insurrectionists uh government is working government is working it's not dysfunctional it's working just fine for the rich it's working just fine for the rich uh well tonight we're gonna uh, stop the live stream and in the zoom room in our virtual studio audience we're going to watch the January six hearings there we were told this was going to be the last one but th it's going to continue and we will talk about the ugliness of this insurrection and how horrible Trump is and uh it's all true it's all true and I still cling to the notion that if Trump gets locked up we'll all be saved and because I'm a patriotic fool I'll be able to tell my kids you see the system worked uh yeah you know my side I'm a Democrat I know that's odious to most people uh if we lock up Trump we will have been saved by a crazed Republican party that wants to turn America into some sort of neolithic totem worshiping tribe of murderous cavemen and I believe that really is their agenda I really do uh what the Democrats what my party is offering is the it could be a lot worse platform that's what the Democrats have to offer it could be a lot worse that's what an abusive father tells his wife and kids it could be a lot worse now get the pot roast and shut your mouth it could be a lot worse go ahead leave call the police but trust me it'll be a lot worse without me it'll be a lot worse and it's all it's all bullshit but there are real world consequences to this kabuki theater of distraction bullshit there are real world consequences uh to this play acting which is you know they're ignoring the real problems in America and there are real world consequences to ignoring the real world problems in America one of the consequences is people will storm the Capitol and try to hang Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi those are real world consequences to ignoring real world problems and by the way if you if you notice the insurrectionists were bipartisan in their anger they wanted to hang Pelosi and Mike Pence bipartisan I'm not making a joke I'm telling you the most dangerous politician in America is the one who can get the American people to stop seeing Republican or Democrat and reduce it down to one thing rich or poor rich or poor I'm going to watch this tonight it's going to be fascinating I'm rooting for the committee I'm rooting against Trump I really am but uh it's interesting to see what Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden's priorities are for example I don't know if you've noticed but it's awfully hot and Biden and Pelosi say they really care about climate change 
where is the prime time select committee where's a select committee on prime time looking into how the oil companies knew they were destroying the planet as far back as the 1950s and covered up the evidence where's that select committee on prime time where is the prime time select committee looking into why half half this country can't come up with one thousand dollars for a medical emergency look I'm furious about what happened on January 6. it was a failed coup unlike the December 12th 2000 coup that succeeded when the Supreme Court gave the presidency to George W. Bush and the vice presidency to Congresswoman Cheney's father. That was an elegant coup where the Supreme Court simply stopped the counting and declared George Bush the winner, even though he lost the popular vote. And had all the votes in Florida been counted, he would have lost Florida and the Electoral College. But the Supreme Court didn't want all the votes counted. It was just easier to declare George W. Bush the winner. That's your old school coup, clean. That's how good Republicans seize power. They do it through the legal system. They don't smear feces all over Statuary Hall. They smear it all over the American people by going off and launching an illegal invasion of Iraq and turning our country over to the oil companies, which is what Congresswoman Cheney's father did. <clears throat> Mass shootings, record heat waves, food shortages here in America, inflation, baby formula shortages, COVID, debt, more debt, famine. Here is the dirty, dark secret. Here is the dirty, dark secret to keep in mind watching the hearings tonight. You and I have more in common with the people who stormed the Capitol than the ones asking the questions. You and I have more in common with the people who stormed the Capitol than the people asking the questions tonight. Again, the people who stormed the Capitol are the worst of the worst. But here's what they got right. They they understand that government is important. The people who understood, uh, the people who stormed the Capitol understand that government is the solution. You have to take it over. You can't ignore government. That's what the insurrectionists understood. Again, they should all be locked up, but you know what they got right? They understood you don't ignore your government. They understood the power of the government. What the insurrectionists got right is if you want to make change, you have to take hold of our government. Now, you don't do it using violence. You do it by voting and running for office and getting involved. Uh, something that we will talk about uh, as the evening wears on. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. If you would like to sit in our virtual studio audience for the watch party, we're going to watch the January 6 hearings tonight at 8 o'clock together. Go to my website, hit pay-per-view. It won't cost you anything. We call it pay-per-view. And it'll take you right into our Zoom room where you can meet our virtual studio audience, watch the hearings with us, talk about it in the chat room. And then after the hearings, we're going to resume the show and take, take your calls and have a wrap up with the Reverend Barry W. Lynn, the professors and Mary Ann, uh, Professor Mary Ann Cummings, Professor Jonathan Bick, Professor Ann Lee, and Alan Minsky, the executive director of uh, Progressive Democrats of America. So go to my website and join us in the virtual studio audience. And while you're over there, sign up for my newsletter. It comes out every, every Friday. I'm David Feldman, davidfeldmanshow.com. When we come back, 
Professor Ben Burgess. I'm on my way to be a billionaire. Now you can make fun of me, but I don't really care. I have a plan to get there by and by. As long as I stay healthy and I never die. Fifteen bucks an hour, five days a week, fifty-two weeks a year. 32,000 years I know it's a long time honey to 34,020 but when I get there babe I'm gonna be in the money I'm on my way to be a billionaire now you can make fun of me but I don't really care I have a plan to get there by and by as long as I stay healthy and I never die All I really need is a second job or a third Lift myself up my boots and join that elite herd Of the 600 billionaires in the USA Who make more in a second than I do in a day I'm on my way, yes I am I'm on my way, I'm on my way, oh yes I am, I'm on my way to be a billionaire, now you can make fun of me, but I don't really care, I a plan to get there yes i do by and by as long as i stay healthy and i never die as long as i stay healthy and i never die as long as i stay healthy and i never die, as as I never die. Sitting next to Bill Crystal, man. I mean, the architects of a catastrophe that have cost this country trillions of dollars, thousands of lives, there should be accountability. I, we should not, if there are no regrets for the failed assumptions that have so grievously wounded this nation, I don't know what happened to our politics and media accountability, but we need it, Bill, because this country should not go back to war. We don't need armchair warriors. And if you feel so strongly, you should, with all due respect, enlist in the Iraqi army. That's a very cute line. Katrina. No, but no, people, but it's real. A million, a million look, look Iraqi, at the displaced. Thousands of people being killed. Can I just make a point? A million Iraqis the have been displaced. You yes. read that story, humanitarian aid for what we have done to that country is a crime. We have done and to that should. country. Porcine hysteria in the greater Bay Area. We heard about it on CNN.com. I guess they're calling it a swine bomb. We've been infested by feral hogs. They messed up my lawn and they ate my dogs. They're taking over and they're out of control. We're gonna organize a swine bomb. We got a swine bomb We're doing the swine bomb boogie These hogs are smelly and they make nasty sounds Some of them weigh close to 800 pounds Now you tell me if you think I'm mistaken Sounds like an awful lot of bacon. These critters are mean, they can tear into you. Here's what they say you're supposed to do get on your car or climb up a tree. Cause pigs can't climb, at least that's what they tell me. We're in a swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. Doing the swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. Folks are getting 
getting guns and shooting them on sight. I doubt if Peter thinks that's all right. All my life I've been for gun control. Now they done put me on swine patrol. Kids can't climb and white men can't jump. All we can do is a bumpity bump. Can we chill these pigs out with some smooth and metal jazz? Round them all up and send them to Alcatraz. We're doing the swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. The pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. The pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. We got swine hogs all over the place. We're doing a swine ball boogie. Pigs can't climb. I don't know what we're gonna do. If I knew, I would tell you. Hello? Oh, Ben is here. Okay. I see. All right. Yeah, I've been here for about five minutes. This Music going. I wasn't sure what cut in. All right. Let me get let me get my arms around. Okay. So are you? We're doing you. Uh, Professor Ben Burgess is joining us, but I think it's via audio. Correct? Uh, yeah. I'm in a car right now, so this is all over the phone. Okay. Where are you heading to? Uh, well, I'm going to spend the night in Kentucky, but I'm going up to Michigan to visit my family. Why are you, uh, why are you heading up to everything? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Every, everything's fine. Okay. Let me just adjust. So it's just, the, uh, yep. All right. Let me just adjust the, okay. Joining us is professor Ben Burgess. He is the author of give them an argument as well as several other books, host of Give Them an Argument. And my one sheet has not arrived, Dan, so I'm flying by. We're a little disorganized today. So uh, no what, what would you like to talk about? <laughs> What's on your mind? Are you excited about the January 6th hearings? Um, no, I mean, I'd be excited. I mean, I'd be excited if Trump was prosecuted, like that would excite me, but I'm not particularly excited just about having hearings about everything that happened. Um, and I'm not wildly optimistic about this being an effective uh, thing, right, to kind of get voters to, to pay attention to this. Um, you know, although you also asked me what was on my mind, and to be yes. honest, you know, most of what I've spent thinking about for the last couple of days has been Michael Brooks because that was the anniversary yesterday. Yes. So, uh, yes. I, you know, yeah. yes, that's it was, been the. Uh, hang on for one second. Yeah. Uh, yes, Michael. I hit the wrong button. Uh, yes, it's been. I cannot believe it's been two years since Michael Brooks. Uh, died unexpectedly well wow. yeah uh I how did you meet michael how, how did i meet him yeah where did you meet him uh i met him in idaho at a conference um so this is uh you know it's a story some people probably heard me say before so i'll i'll just do it quickly but i had uh, there was, back then, uh, this was kind of at the height of the Jordan Peterson phenomenon in, in 2018, and a little while beforehand, uh, Michael and my mutual friend and editor, Doug Lane, who acquired and edited both of our books for, for Zero Books, um, had been running the Zero Books podcast, and he'd had... Uh, Jordan Peterson booked as a guest, and then uh, and then Peterson, or perhaps somebody works for him, I don't know, realized, like, must have Googled Doug and realized it wasn't going to be a friendly interview, and so they they, uh, they backed out. And then uh, very shortly after that, uh, Peterson was on. Yeah. You say, can you hear me? 
Hello? Well, we were talking with Professor Ben Burgess. Uh, ben Burgess has said that if you want an introduction to Michael Brooks, you should go on YouTube and watch his lecture at Lafayette College. And uh, that's the, if you if you don't know who Michael Brooks is, I assume most of my listeners do know who Michael Brooks is. Uh, but if you don't, watch him on YouTube, his lecture at uh, Lafayette College. That's a, a great introduction. All right, we're having technical problems, which we will not have during our watch party, Dan, in the newsroom. We're, I, know, I do know how we can pull this off. We're going to be able to watch the January 6 hearings and then talk about it after. Uh, but, but we have lost uh, uh, Professor Ben Burgess. Uh, do we have a, what do we have in terms of a quiz, oh, quiz master? We don't have a quiz tonight. We don't have a quiz tonight. <laughs> How about that? We don't, we've lost <laughs> Professor Ben Burgess. We don't have a one sheet. Did you get a one sheet? I got it and I just forwarded it to your could email you, and I texted it to you. You could text it to me. I did both. Okay. As soon as you said it within one minute. Yeah. So uh, you should have it. This is. But, and you also just said that uh, you could pull it off. So I'm assuming that. I just might. <laughs> I just might pull it off. Coming up. Oh. Coming up at seven, the Hershenfelds. And then at 7 30, Emil Guillermo, host of the PETA podcast. And then at eight o'clock, our viewing party, we watched the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. And then the show, uh, the live stream resumes right after the hearings are finished and we will discuss it. That's all coming up. Uh, I know we have a lot of listeners in, uh, in our chat room. If you wanna talk about Michael Brooks, Raise your hand. And Professor Ben just showed back up. He must have lost connection for a moment. I, I just, I, you know what, Professor Ben, are you there? Uh, I am comedian, Dave. What's up? Okay, so you say his lecture at Lafayette College is the best entry into the thinking of, of Michael Brooks, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, a, well, I think it's a really good introduction to him because he lays a lot of things out for an audience not necessarily familiar with him. He talks about his uh, his life a little bit. He talks about some of his big influences, like Adolf Reed. He talks about his book, and it's all very succinct. Right. Uh, okay. Let's talk about marijuana. You've been writing about marijuana over at the Daily Beast. What was your, your piece about marijuana and Joe Biden about it? Is he smoking any? <laughs> I hope. Uh, I think he may have, because uh, when he was running for president, he uh, he said that uh, when he was president, he would deschedule cannabis and pardon everybody serving federal prison sentences for nonviolent weed offenses and also expunge the criminal records. Hazard reported ahead on I-75 and in a quarter mile. And You're still on the fastest. Your wife did not. Will you tell that? Record. Hang on for one second. I am so sick of your wife interrupting this show and telling you how to drive. When is she going to stop? Yeah. Is that your I know, wife? I know. Uh, but she still. Oh, yeah, clearly. I mean, she sounds so confident. You know. uh, that's, how she, that's how she talks to me, too. You know, hazard reported ahead. But, yeah, no, I, I think it's entirely possible that uh, Biden has been partaking because he, he promised that he would do all that stuff. And then I could only surmise that he must have gotten high and forgotten. <laughs> he was probably using some of Hunter's stash, which I think uh, I think there was some stuff in the pipe that wasn't pot quite frankly hey what happens i want to get back to marijuana in a second there is a report coming out of cnn yeah. that the justice department is ready yeah. to criminally charge hunter biden uh then the republicans win the house although that's not certain it's just going to be yeah. 
24 hours of round the clock impeachment, right? And it's going to be I would, I would think so. it's going to be hard for people like you and me who you voted for Biden, right? I did. And I did too. And I'm hoping the Democrats keep the House and the Senate. But it's going to be really hard to do what we did for Hillary and Obama and make excuses for them this time around, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know who this we is who made excuses for those people. But yeah, look, I think that uh, uh, I agree. I mean, the Republicans probably are going to go hard on these like petty scandals. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to play out for them. Um, I mean, I I don't think this is very eccentric. I would say for all the things that I hate about Joe Biden, that I definitely had to you know, hold my day, think about the nation for to, to get myself to vote for him in my swing state. But uh, for all the things I hate about Joe Biden, you know, his relationship with Hunter is actually something that kind of humanizes him for me. You know, that the, that's, uh, you know, like he has this kid who had a, you know, has probably uh, these severe addictions and you know, seem to be trying to do his best to be there for him and be a loving father. I mean, like, I think I expect that right about now, there are a lot of voters who can identify with that. I mean, like, that seems like, you know, the fact that he kind of, like, you know, stuck by oh, hunting is actually, hang on. you know, I mean, hang on for one second. Sure. If you have a sure. son who is as deeply troubled as Hunter Biden is, you cannot yeah. say to him, even though he's pushing 50 or what, I don't know how old Hunter is, you cannot say to Hunter Biden, I am there for you. I'm your father. I'm there for you 100%. But I'm also going to be the most powerful leader on the planet and run the executive branch. But I will be there for you when I'm not president of the United States. You can't, you can't be president of the United States and a good father at the same time. It's impossible. You're going to shortchange somebody. In Biden's case, he's shortchanged both. We get a shitty president, and he's a lousy father. Well, I, think a, you run, I don't think you run for president. I'm not sure. I'm... You don't run for president if Hunter Biden's your son. Not because of the scandal, just uh, maybe spend time with your grandkids and shore up the family. Maybe that's a little important, especially when you're pushing 80. Maybe you can put your ambition aside and take care of your family. Well, I, well, I certainly wish that I certainly wish that Joe Biden had uh, had done that, you know, since uh, for one thing, in an immediate sense, uh, if if he had done that, uh, who knows what would have happened in the 2020 primaries. I mean, I think that uh, you know, I, I hear for Bernie to uh, to beat Mayor Pete uh, if he was the main centrist, but um, and also because yeah, I mean Joe Biden has has been. I mean, I think that like again, whatever you think that he should or shouldn't be doing with you know with Hunter or other people in the family, like uh, you know, he also seems to be not entirely there. I mean, I like superficially at least, right? I mean, there keep being these clips where he'll he'll try to shake hands with nobody. Right? Yeah. Like like he'll he'll be like turning to empty space with his hand up. So yeah, I mean I for all sorts of reasons I wish he weren't president right now. I think the fact that he is means that um, you know, means that it's very, very likely that, you know, Trump or I guess maybe Ron DeSantis, who wouldn't be better, right, is going to uh is going to be elected in uh, in 2024, you know, because uh, because Biden has uh, has screwed it all up to like an almost unbelievable degree, right? Like, and some of that has been because of factors that are outside of his control, you know, mansion and all that stuff. We could argue about what he could have tried to do to, to exert more pressure on him, but like some of that stuff is entirely within his control, and it's a small thing in a certain you know, maybe compared to some other issues. But I think that um, the broken promises on marijuana actually 
are kind of an amazing indicator of that. Well, what, what is the American? If you think people, about that. What are the American people? How popular is marijuana reform in America? I would think it's incredibly popular. It's super popular. There's uh, like there's some of the uh, the polls from like Pew and Gallup. Uh, a slight majority of Republicans are in favor of it. An overwhelming majority of Democrats and independents are in favor of it. I think overall among Americans as a whole, it's, it's in the high 60s, you know, for not just for what Biden said he would do, but for going further than what Biden said he'd do and doing full scale federal recreational legalization, right? Those are the numbers for that. So, yeah, I think it would be wildly popular. So it's an easy no win. Significant it, base that the, it's an easy win. And- exactly, yeah. And it would actually pull a lot of, uh, you know, I could see Joe Rogan and his listeners uh, deciding to vote for Biden just on that alone. It would excite, it would be, a, it's an easy win. It's something that he promised he would do that would be incredibly popular if he did. And also, Best of all, it's something that is a hundred percent within his control, right? That there's no, you don't have to consult the parliamentarian. You don't have to, you don't have to get Mansion and Cinema on board. There's none of that because this is all stuff you can just do within the executive branch. You know that the um, the law doesn't dictate where the DEA, you know, like which schedule the DEA puts. Um, uh, marijuana on and the Controlled Substances Act. Right now, it's on the you know the one you know Schedule One for the most uh, for the most dangerous drugs with no medical application, which is nonsensical on its face. Uh, there's nobody, as far as I know, denies that the president has the legal power to pardon anybody who feels yeah. like pardoning. You know, who's in, who's serving time in federal prison. So the fact and like this is something like there's an ad uh, I linked to in the piece that Biden did on October 27, 2020, where he reiterates all of his promises. So this is like a week before uh, everybody voted. Right. And, or actually, if you remember the 2020 elections, while a lot of people have voted, but a week before anybody who voted in person voted. And it's, um, and so why did he do that? Right. And they like, he knew this was really popular. So I can understand some of the other instances in which Biden has not done things that he said he would do that are really popular uh, right. and that he could have done because in some of the other cases like like the obvious example for me is raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour right he said he would do that uh, the, uh, you know I mean that was part of his campaign platform uh, it's very popular it's not as popular as weed legalization but it's very popular and um, and they totally could have done that right Democrats had the votes for that. The only reason it didn't happen is because the parliamentarian said that, uh, you know, there weren't significant enough budgetary effects to do it within reconciliation. But I mean, that's a low level staffer who issues non-binding opinions. They could have just ignored her or fired her. Um, so that's like a case that like hits all three of those, right? It'd be within the Democrat power to do it. It's popular. They said they would do it, but I understand why they didn't do that. Right? They didn't do that because it's, uh, you know, because it's bad for the profits of corporate America. If like yeah. you know, working class people make more money. Yeah. Uh, so well, let's talk about it. I can understand from the perspective why, why, why they didn't do it. I was, I was just going to say this is what makes the weed thing inexplicable because it doesn't even have that. Right? This would actually be great for business, right? Because uh, uh, you know, it would, be, it would be good for the economy in the cynical pro-business sense of good for the economy because. Uh, you know, weed shops could finally take credit card payments, you know, like it would actually, um, it would actually be good from that perspective, right? Like there's, there's no, like there's no argument against it, you know, except for, I don't know, that's that or whatever. Although if that's what, if, if that's the case, right, if it's just the Joe Biden at heart is just yeah. too much of a drug warrior to do it, then why did he say that he was going to do it, right? Like he said he was going to do it. Because he knew it was good politics, it'd be even better politics to do it now. So, honestly, most of the time that Biden does stuff I hate, I feel like I understand it. In this case, I have no clue why he hasn't done this. Let's talk about another piece you had over at the Daily Beast, which I really loved. 
you, it's entitled, it came out about a month ago, Bernie Sanders, Democratic Socialist Successors are more woke than progressive. You saw Bernie's debate against Lindsey O. Graham on Fox News. And, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, Fox News can't wait to talk about pronouns and, and uh, transgender bathroom issues. You say Bernie stayed on me message and just talked about health care, wages, retirement savings, and the billionaire class. The woke, you know, I'm all f for wokeness, but I agree with what you wrote yeah. in the Daily Beast, that if you want to win over the insurrectionists, let's be honest, if you're on Fox News uh, and you're... you're, you're uh playing to the insurrectionists talk about health care wages retirement savings inflation and the billionaire class and you will hive off some of these people why why don't the progressives in congress understand that woke is important but you're you're not going to get any more voters being woke you're actually going to push them away. Yeah, so I should say uh, I didn't write the title, and I'm not actually 100% sure what more woke than progressive means. Uh, but uh, well, I do. To me, a know, I, I think it to me, a progressive uh, identifies the importance of uh, abortion, contraception, gay marriage, gay sex, interracial marriage, all the things that the Supreme Court is putting on the chopping block. Pronouns. Yeah, yeah. It, nope. it, and that is important. But if you want to win, if you want to win elections, you talk about inflation, the billionaire class, retirement savings, health care and wages. It's the economy, stupid. That's how you win. And, you know, yeah, like no, I, I, I love AOC, I really like but, but she's got to stay on message. She she already has the woke vote. It's the construction worker she needs. Yeah, I think that's I think that's basically right. I mean, I think that uh, one of the best things about Bernie as a political communicator is just how good he is about staying on message. And I was going to say, on the woke thing, if if woke just means like has socially progressive positions on what the law should be, then I agree that's important, right? If if it means a certain kind of style of rhetoric or shaming people or whatever, then I think it can be counterproductive. But I think that the what I I really like about Bernie as a political communicator, and I think a lot of the other congressional progressives are not as good at, frankly, is that, uh, is that he, he focuses on the issues that the right least wants to talk about because they know their positions are incredibly unpopular, right? That they, mm -hmm. uh, all of those issues that you just mentioned, that, uh, I mean, in some ways, I would, I would argue that all of, like, Republican politics right now is a sustained effort to never have to talk about those things, right? To, right. to find ways of, 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 of avoiding the subjects. And, uh, and Bernie, I mean, that's, that's what he, he lives and breathes, right? I mean, it's like, if you go to Skinner concert, you're going to hear free bird. You go to a Bernie Sanders rally, you're going to hear we're the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee healthcare is a right. And I think that's exactly right. I think that the instinct that somebody like Bernie has is so positive. And I wish that more nations were adopting this model. Is that if you ask about one of those social issues that I agree we can't be neutral on, they're important. Um, she will give a succinct but very clear answer that comes from the same moral commitment to egalitarianism, to equal rights for everybody that motivates his economic politics. So he'll. He'll say, I believe in a woman's right to control her own body. He'll say, you know, we shouldn't discriminate against anybody, whatever the case may be. But then he's going to pivot right back because he has such good message discipline to those subjects on which the left's, um, on which the left's agenda is most popular, that cut the most across culture war lines, 
and then the right at least wants to talk about, you know, like you should have a union, uh, everybody should have health care, you know, stuff like that. And and I do find it disappointing. Uh, I think that like what we see from a lot of Bernie crowds, uh, you know, besides Bernie, uh, is, you know, I, I think John Fetterman, who I wrote about recently for Jacobin, you know, he has his flaws. I tried to, I tried to sort of be warts and all about it in the article, but I think that, I think that he's also good on this. Uh, that you know that this is a this is a model that I think can just be much more, um, you know, can just be much more effective trying to right. uh, const- constantly appeal to Team Blue in the culture war and sort of paste the Bernie Sanders program on top of that, right? I mean, right. you know, you, you you keep the focus. Uh, you keep the focus precisely where the right, for very good reasons, uh, from their perspective, doesn't want it to, to be on, right? I mean, like, like you don't call, if you're going to debate Lindsey Graham, you know, instead of, uh, instead of calling Graham a bigot or, you know, like focusing on even the Republican Party, right? Like, Sanders doesn't even really do that, right? What he does is he says this is, you know, he refers to Lindsay in one of his opening statements as as uh, a representative of the establishment, and you know starts talking about you know about healthcare, retirement savings, and and all of that stuff. Because I think if you're going to appeal, and I'm not talking about the most hardcore conservatives, right? I don't think you're going to get those, right? But like, if you're going to appeal to people who are not yet on your side, who are winnable, I think that the I think by far the most promising way to appeal to them is by saying, here's how our program could materially benefit you. Right. We have to wrap it up. Uh, ben Burgess is a philosophy professor at Morehouse College, a columnist for Jacobin Magazine, as well as The Daily Beast, and author of several books, most recently, Christopher Hitchens, What He Got Right, How He Went Wrong, Why He Still Matters. Thank you, pro- thank you Professor. Uh, thank you, Canadian. Okay, drive safely. How, uh, is the road burning up? Is there is there asphalt to drive on? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay for now. Gas is too expensive, but otherwise it's all right. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's Professor thank Ben. You. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. It's our January 6th Select Committee hearing viewing party. In exactly one hour, we're going to shut down the live stream and everybody in the virtual studio audience, we're all going to watch the the hearings for, I think it's going to be about two hours. Then we will resume the show. We'll go live on YouTube again. I will take your calls. If you would like to watch the uh, select committee hearings with us, go to my website and hit pay-per-view. It's doesn't cost anything. We just call it pay-per-view. It'll give you the link. You can join our virtual studio audience, join the conversation. And uh, yeah, I just want to add one thing about AOC and this, how, how we're allowing the right to define what we stand for. This is from last week's Economist, which I think as far as liberal magazines go. The Economist is pretty solid. The Economist writes, fringe and sometimes dotty ideas have crept into democratic rhetoric, peaking in the feverish summer of 2020 with a movement to quote unquote, defund the police, abolish immigration enforcement, shun capitalism, relabel women as birthing people, and inject anti-racism into the classroom. If the Democrats are defined by their most extreme and least popular ideas, they will be handing a winning agenda of culture war grievance to the Republican Party. Well, it crept into, it, it, these topics didn't creep into Democratic rhetoric. There are very few Democrats who are talking about defunding the police, who are talking about abolishing immigration enforcement. There is absolutely no one in the Democratic Party who talks about shunning capitalism, 
I have never heard a democratically elected Democrat talk about relabeling women as birthing people. That's creeping into democratic rhetoric as reported by Fox News or magazines like The Economist. This is, uh, some of these things that The Economist brings up are minor policy issues like defunding the police, uh, which we could talk about later. Uh, I happen to believe in defunding the police. I think that's a bad uh, phrase. I think we can do better, like fund the social workers, uh, abolishing immigration enforcement. Nobody's calling for that. We're talking about getting rid of ICE. Nobody's shunning capitalism. They're criticizing it. I've never heard of anybody trying to relabel women as birthing people and anti-racism. Uh, my God, I, with all that's going on in, in, in the world, uh, Fox News and the right wing is upset because it's more important to say you're anti-racist uh, than not racist. I don't know. It's, it's all nonsense. And as Ben Burgess talks about it over at the Daily Beast, do what Bernie does, talk about five things, wages, the billionaire class, the environment, raising the minimum wage, health care. Uh, the woke vote is important, but we already have it. Uh, Let's go to the Hershenfelds. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst, and he joins us, I believe, uh, on video. Are you there? And Ethan, Hello. And Ethan Hershenfeld joins us. Are you gentlemen uh, not showing your video? We're no, trying. You're we're not trying. allowing. You're not allowing it. It says we're the host has stopped it. You've stopped us, David. You're blocking us. You yeah. stopped us. Yes. Uh, this is a recurring problem. So oh, I think it's anti-Semitism. Well, everything's anti-Semitism. Okay, there you go. Uh, Anne, are you there? Okay, I can't. Uh, Do you want us to sign out? Should I sign out and sign uh, back? No, in? No, 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 I'm working. I'm working on it. I'll, I'll get it straightened out in the next thirty seconds or so. In the meantime, let me just say unto my people. You have been evil, and this has not gone unnoticed, and your payback will be swift. Right. You should have the ability now. All right, let's see if we can. Thank you, Dan. Ask to start video, and there we there go. There he is. Okay. We're going to have to start. Uh, we're going to have a meeting. We're going to have a meeting. Okay. Hello. It's nice hello. How, how are you nice doing? I'm I'm hanging in there. It's hot. And Listen, David, I completely agree with you. It, it's the economy, stupid. Um, he was brilliant. He got elected. Staying on message. I think part of the problem may be that just like Trump likes whipping up his own crowd by saying crazy stuff. Maybe people on the far left like the same thing rather than staying on message. It's the economy, stupid. And they may get a lot of gratification from that. It, it shows, yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to beat up on the left because the left right. does a pretty good job of that all by themselves. And I consider myself a leftist and I do think that we all have to grow and learn how to communicate better and if people want to be identified by different pronouns we honor that it's it's no or but the real issues facing this country are physical safety and there, you can only isolate five issues to talk about to win elections correct 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 yes you, it, it can't be I'm for all of the above. And the way you win elections is you talk about jobs, inflation, health care, and you demonize the ruling class. That's how you win elections. 
it seems that the Republicans are saying now that yes, global warming is a problem. We're all going to fry to death, but our economy is more important. So we're not going to do anything to affect our economy. And I think that's ass backwards, but it, it's, it may be a women, winning strategy. Politically, but not economically, because as yeah. Joe Biden pointed out, climate change is costing something like $350 billion a year. But I guess if you're Wall Street at $350 billion, that just means more money is moving around the economy and you get to skim off the top. So it's a good thing. Right. Uh, now, you're in Cape Cod, Ethan. Yeah, I just got back here after two weeks. And uh, last night I shot that new uh, Showtime pilot, my little scene in that, which was full of a lot of fun with uh, with Mandy Patinkin and his wife, Catherine Grody. They were very funny. The scene was very funny. And it was very satisfying, but it was very hot. So um, I even got to, uh, I, 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 at one point I thought of a funny line. Their son is the writer, and um, the director is the director, and I was just doing a small role. But I thought, I got to tell them this line. I had a line, and then, so I very politely said to the director, look, this might be above my pay grade. I'm doing this small part, but I think if, if this would be funny. So he relayed it. They liked it. The actor liked it. Then the producer liked it. Then the, the writer liked it. So I got a, it was very satisfying. That's so, great. Yeah. Cape Cod has been described to me as idyllic. I think we went there when I was very young. Has it been, it, it's not Martha's Vineyard. It's not been taken over. By the... No, it's a, uh, Martha's Vineyard is an island and Cape Cod is a peninsula, but it's the same thing, I think, uh, topographically. And the it's, sharks, it's the same sharks chewing on the, basically the same bathers. Yeah. You, but has it been taken over by? Oh. Has it been Hamptonized? No, in, in fact, um, I, there's one, uh, I was driving uh, today with a friend who was dog sitting and then right before he left, we went to the beach and we were driving and there's one house that's so Hamptons and disgusting and I pointed it out to him and I said, <laughs> I used that exact word. I, it was just a disgrace. And sure enough, the owner is out front today. It was a cottage that was probably about 28 feet wide and now it's about 85 feet wide he just made it sprawl and then he put in a lawn and all sorts of landscaping and today there are trucks there moving dirt and putting in trees and this asshole is standing on the lawn there ordering people you know he should he should just fall in one of those holes it's it's the wrong but anyway you know as long as he's having fun that's really my attitude so uh, dr hershenfeld i was driving around new jersey i think it was yesterday we stumbled into uh, one of the lakes, not the actual lake. It's a town, something lakes. Pond Franklin. Franklin. Franklin Lakes. Franklin Lakes. Have you driven through Franklin Lakes? Nope. I've heard of it. Very arboreal. A lot of trees. Nope. And then these gabled mansions. And I start looking and I fall prey to it. I think, well, I would be happy. This would make me happy living in there. But... <laughs> I don't think it would make you happy. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. No. You know. <laughs> I heard that. I was quoting a punchline. A woman I know, she was just taking the comedy workshop. She did one of the greatest jokes I've ever heard. She worked as a, she worked as a teacher, <laughs> a math teacher, and she told this joke that one of her students raised his hand and says, yeah, but, you know, all this algebra, like, am I going to really have to know this when I grow up? And she says, you know. <laughs> I just I almost fell over it was such a great joke how much of the stuff Dr. Hershenfeld that you were forced to learn you're actually using now as a psychiatrist um, you mean like in medical school I would just say yeah all the well, yeah. I, that's not fair about the medical school because you become a specialist yeah. But the math, I guess the, the math and the chemistry and yeah. uh, you know, 
I, I, let me give you a uh, a Devar Torah. A Devar Torah. <laughs> so, so I have a certain medical condition. It's not going to kill me so soon. So don't get excited, David. <sighs> but it, it's you know it, it's not critical, but it needs taken care of. But of course, modern day hospitals are organized so that the surgeon, all he does is operate because they get paid for operating. Nobody pays anybody for talking to patients. So who do I get to talk to? Something, a new invention called a PA, a physician's assistant. And this person is supposed to answer my questions. And I've said to this person directly, you seem like a very nice young girl. But I hope you didn't use the word girl. <laughs> or young. <laughs> I, I, or said, I said, said birth, birthing, birthing person. No, no, come on. <laughs> Terrible look. She's a professional. You can't call her a girl. There's no. It's not whatever. No, it's. It matters. It ma everything matters. No, this Listen. matters. Listen, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But I said, you're not a physician, so you tell me stuff, and that's. It's nice to hear your thinking, but I'm not sure I believe any of it. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't go to 12 years of medical school. You don't have all that knowledge behind you. You may know this little wedge that applies to me, but... So in, basically you were sweet-talking her. <laughs> That's it. You were trying to charm her. Uh, Can That's I your answer. That, that, that you got to go through, you know, the ritual and... Um, it's, it's so, so you know a lot of different stuff and people know you know a lot of different stuff and some of it is applicable. I'm glad I did it. Plenty of people are shrinks without having a medical degree and God bless them as my younger colleague would say. But, well, Dr. Uh, Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin, uh, doesn't have a medical exactly. degree. Exactly. In fact, but, he has no degree. But, but he huh. calls himself a doctor. Well, he's a doctor. He's almost a doctor in other fields. Right. Not Let me push back on one thing the, the doctor just said. You're, no. you're, you're a little biased here because you are a, a medical doctor. But my experience has been uh, being in an emergency room, it's when the rubber meets the road, it's the nurses and the doctors get out of the way. That's what I've seen. The doctors act like they're in charge. Yeah. It's and I, and I saw that uh, without revealing too much about what I've been through. It was it is the nurses who know everything. Much well, more. in I would agree with you in that kind of a situation, but in more complex situations that need a lot of thought and understanding and statistical knowledge and uh, knowledge of various medications and blah, blah, blah. I'll take the doctor. Thank you very much. Well, you know more than I do, but my advice to listeners is when you are in a situation where a loved one is needs medical attention, uh, make sure you're polite to the nurses. Yeah. And and listen, he knows more than you do, and I know more than both of you. <laughs> and I will tell you that you're right, David. Um, I had a doctor once when I accidentally cut my finger. I went into the ER, and he was he gave me the most idiotic exam to see whether I had I uh, sliced the nerve and. I knew what he was doing was idiotic. I knew I had cut the nerve in my thumb. This was about 25, 30 years ago. And he, he was a doctor. 
I mean, he, he, he hadn't specialized yet, but he knew nothing. He was just an absolute idiot. So I would have any day rather had a, a nurse or just someone with a little bit of common sense doing that exam. So, By the way, we should mention that Ethan's alter ego yes. is Dr. Samuel Benjamin, yes. founder and chief emotional officer of the New York uh, American Institute of Eclectic Modality. And everybody should go to Amazon. You get special dispensation and pick up Today Is Now. Today Is Now. Dr. The book. Yes. It's not just a book. It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle choice. I don't think it's a good lifestyle choice necessarily, but it's a choice. And also you're born with it. So it's both nurture and it's nature. So it's pretty amazing. That's what makes it eclectic. It's eclectic modality therapy. And it will change your life, not necessarily for the better, probably not. But it will change your life by $14 if you get the hardcover. And it will change your life by 7 if you get the paperback. But change, change is guaranteed. Today is now. Uh, get the book, live the lifestyle, and see the movie, which will be coming out in the fall. I, I just want to say that you changed my life because uh, two weeks ago I had 14 extra dollars. <laughs> I bought the hardcover of Today Is Now. Thank and you. I now no longer have that fourteen dollars in my checking account and i yeah. want to pay for that because i was right. and one one thing that to quote my own book what dr benjamin says is in it's a chapter about change and what he says basically about change and of course change is the bread and butter of therapy no one goes to therapy because they're happy the way things are everyone goes to therapy because they think that they want something to be different but one of the most important insights and pieces of advice because he's not he's not a, a strict Freudian in the sense that he's unwilling to dispense advice he's happy to talk in fact he talks a lot in fact he rarely shuts up um, so one of the things that he points out about change is that you should always count it <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, a serious question for Dr. Hershenfeld uh -oh. you are a Freudian psychoanalyst that requires you to listen for long stretches of time it's the talking cure is it still the talking cure yeah yes it is yeah so you go to work and you listen all day not exclusively but i try to listen more than i speak how's that and that's, that's why god gave you two ears and one mouth Right. I'm gassy today. So I'm anyway, I'm not going to. So listening. So I doing this podcast, you have a chapter on listening. I have a chapter entitled listening. Dr. Benjamin has a very short chapter entitled what? listening. So um, what does he uh, say about listening? Because I had a, I, well, let me let me lay it on you. It's only about a minute of text listening. You may have felt the urge to interrupt an interlocutor and interject your big idea, your clever retort. You have the urge to take the reins of the conversation and trot off to a different corner of the ranch. That's natural. That's what it means to be a social creature, a communicator. But what if you were to ignore that urge and just go along for the ride? Be all ears in the literal sense of the phrase. Picture yourself as a fleshy and cartilaginous human ear, lobe and all. Maybe, maybe some little hairs. Maybe not. I'm just, I'm just being silly. Uh, uh, right. And some tiny bones and, a, and little crystals to boot. Notice what happens when you let yourself become nothing but a receiver of sound. Just how sensitive can you get? There you go. Like the microscopic cilia, you literally don't miss a beat. You are a high fidelity receiver. Listen, listen, and then listen a little deeper. How deep can you go? Brilliant. Right, right. Okay. That, 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 so, Dr. Hershenfeld, yes. listening requires concentration. It also requires, well, f go ahead, it doesn't? Well, a certain type of concentration. Um, Freud recommended a kind of free-floating attention where you're also... Oh, you're I, you're also at the same moment able to write up the bill. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, sorry, I interrupted. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Well, you're also paying attention to your own associations because very often they tell you important things about what's being communicated to you that, that, that um, are not obvious on the surface. So it's not concentrating like I got to listen to every word and, and memorize it. It's a different type of listening. But it's, it's a listening that acknowledges, if I may, uh, as Dr. Benjamin, it's a listening that acknowledges that in the end, in the therapeutic relationship, in the end, as Freud said, it's all about me. <laughs> you may think it's about you, but it's about me. You That's called the transference. <laughs> Do they train you? Do, you, do they train you in listening? Is it they do. They in the in the rigorous at the at the New York American Institute of Eclectic Modality Therapy. What we do is we take the candidates, and we seat them in a chair, a very comfortable chair, and then we throw firecrackers and we we blast the we blast the TV and we clap and we snap in their faces and we just we, we try we try to distract them as much as possible. We yell at them. We we will arrange for ambulances to pass on the street. All in an attempt. You really have to train. To against distraction by distracting the candidate as much as possible. Right, right. I right. give a whole course actually in analytic listening. Yeah. Indeed. And I give a course at my institute, it's called Listening While Also Texting. <laughs> right. So you can be at dinner with your spouse or whomever and, and just continue to text uh, as much as possible. But you're really, you're really paying attention. L listening. <sighs> is a form of communication that as you sit, but my experience has been sitting in meetings, the, the truly brilliant people that I've, that I know are the ones who can sit in a meeting and listen. I'm in awe of them where they, they, they can take it in. Not only if they're, in, there's some people who aren't in charge, who just sit, not just who listen, they are completely focused. They only talk when it's absolutely necessary. I guess that everybody, that's right? everybody else who's j jabbering away all the time are just trying to show off how brilliant they are. And they're probably not. Right. It's a, it's a confidence game of not talking. Well, look at, uh, Justice Thomas, he hasn't spoken in 30 years. Right. And he's th thereby very slowly, as like, like, like a black hole, like a gravitational force, he's taken all of the power of that court just through silence. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's like a Jedi mind trick. Well, what advice do you think Dr. Samuel Benjamin would give to people who are starting out in their career? <laughs> Don't talk, right? Don't talk. Don't talk, but also don't listen. <laughs> because what you'll find as a youth is that a lot of people have a lot of advice for you and they're full of a lot of shit. So that's the main thing. They're telling you all of their, their 2020 hindsight about their sorry excuses, their, the disastrous lives that they've led. And they're trying to build some advice based on that, that rickety scaffolding. So the key thing is just ignore them. It's also something that I advocate as Dr. Benjamin in intimate relationships. People say it's really all about, it's all about trust and about listening. And it's really not about that. Just do what you want to do. If you have two people doing exactly what they want to do, that's a happy couple. Right. Think about it. They're both doing what they want to do. Together. They're happy. Together or nearby or in a neighboring borough or in the next state, but they're happy. As opposed to these couples, they're always compromising and it's, it's like a conveyor belt of compromises. Right. That's, that's, a, that's like, a, that's like a, a life sentence. Right, you do you, I'll do me, yeah. and I'll look over and see you doing you, and yeah. I'll me, and yeah. then I'll yeah. do your, your best friend and your sister, and yeah. Yeah. I will tell you. <laughs> Before you go, Dr. Hershenfeld. Where am I going? But, well, b before we go, 
I have noticed that I have to stop lecturing my children, that, that I, I fancy myself trying to impart wisdom, but I, it's not wisdom, it's just me wanting to dominate them, right? Yeah, it's totally useless. You, you, I've said this to you before, but it's really hard for you to, uh, to get it. You lead by example. Now, that doesn't work 100% of the time, but it works more often than lecturing. Right, right. It just does. Instead of telling my kids not to drink and drive, I should drink and drive and crash the car. And uh, there you go. And I'm an example of why it's a bad idea. What are you reading? So. I'm still reading The Odyssey. Where is it? Where is I it? love it. I, by the way, David, you impressed me. You're not just the, you know, the, the, the dummy you come across as. Um, when I told you last week that I was reading the Odyssey, you said, oh, the Fitzgerald translation. Now, in my estimation, that, that puts you into the intellectual category. Uh, well, I mean, that's the famous... Whatever, I think like one out of 500 Americans could have come up with that. The son's name is Telemachus? Yeah, Telemachus, yes, exactly. Okay. What's the dog's name? Here's a stumper. Uh, I'm trying, I'm sorry, was there a Priam who was courting Penelope? Priam, Priam was the um, king Northern. of Troy. Who, who is Penelope the wife who's knitting, waiting for him to come knitting home? Knitting away, waiting for him to come home, yes. The and dog was Astro. Close. And Ar was Argos. Argos was his dog. And the dog was waiting for 20 years. Ulysses shows up. Argos lifts his head, wags his tail, and... And dies. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh. Well, very sad. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful story. It's, it's uh, an exciting story. I'm up to the best part now. When Ulysses kills all the suitors, that oh, he's back home. A, he's back home. There's such an amazing buildup to this moment. It's thrilling. Is the only word I can think of. Who was the big? Was it Antony? Who? There was one suitor who. Really Antonus. Antonus, yes, courting P Penelope. Seems to me Penelope could have saved Ulysses a lot of aggravation and not allowed all these men in the house, don't you think? Uh, they, they barged in and they wouldn't leave. They really? were powerful men. Well, and plus there would not have been any story if she had done if she had locked the door. Uh, you, now you're tempting me to uh, reread that. I'm going to have to read it. I never read it. I read the selections we had to read in middle school or whatever. But watch this, Professor Hershenfeld. Watch this. What are you reading, <laughs> Ethan? Watch this. What are you reading? I'm reading uh, "Today Is Now" by Dr. <laughs> Samuel Benjamin. Is that the Fitzgerald translation? <laughs> Fitzgerald translated this into Greek. If you want to read the Greek, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, "Today what, Is Now." Um. By the way, I wanted to say this off topic, which is that I know Matthew Pottinger. Oh, excuse me for one second. Yeah. We started Winter's Bone. Oh. Oh, good I started work. started Winter's Bone, and the phone rang, and because I'm watching it on my phone, it was a little hard to get back to because it's a little, it's one of those movies that should be seen in a theater, but I'm going to, over the weekend, I'm good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a movie theater with my phone, pay $15, you know, Thor is playing and I'll watch my phone. It is, it is bleak, but it is, it's redemptive at the same time. I will, I, I will get through it. Ethan, okay. I interrupted you. No, no, no. I was simply going to say that I know the guy who's testifying tonight. I know him personally, Matthew Pottinger, and I can say that he's a real mensch. Because uh, his brother was one of my college roommates and is a good friend I, of mine. I thought that was the guy. Yeah. yeah. And I, I knew him personally 30 years ago, but he's an amazing guy. Became a Marine, <laughs> taught himself Mandarin, and became a, a journalist. And then. But a, 
Yes. Yeah. What a mensch. A mensch. Four years. He, he stayed with Trump for how long? How long did he work? No, but he was, but I know, but he was one of the guys. You heard about these people who they think they could actually be in there and do something useful and be moderating. The fact that you're working in there, you know, there's an argument to be made. He quit. Did he go to the Justice Department? So I don't know. Let's hear what he has to say. Hear what he has to say. Well, I mean, it seems to me, I know he's your friend. No, 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 no. I, I know him personally. I, I can't say he's my friend. I, I, but I, I'm... Seems to me, I don't know much, but if you're working and your boss is about to wage an insurrection, quitting is good, but also going to the Justice Department, being a whistleblower. Right, right, right. That's what... That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, everybody go by. Today is now. Thank you. Thank you. That's the back cover, which includes a dog. So, you know. Argos. Argos. No, Fafner. That's Fafner. And uh, go by today is now. If you don't laugh hysterically, I will reimburse you. That's my deal. guarantee. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Hershenfeld. Thank you, David. Thank you. Peace. Stay cool. Stay peace, cool. peace unto all of you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. And go watch Thug Thug Jew on, oh, thank you. on yeah. YouTube. Let's get it up. Let, that should be a million. That should be a million views. Thanks, man. Thank you. Be cool. Adios. Well, David. Emil Guillermo joins us. We have exactly 25 minutes before be. the January 6th Select Committee hearings begin. And I just want to invite people who are watching us on YouTube to come on over and join the watch party starting at 8 p.m. We're gonna watch it together. We're gonna to stop the live stream and then resume it, I guess at 10, uh, to talk about what we saw. They, they've given us a lot of tips. I mean, they can go into more detail, but uh, that Kinzinger uh, tweet pretty much has sort of told you that you're going to hear from a lot of high ranking Republican officials what Trump did. Uh, he was not a leader. He was a voyeur. He was watching television. He was watching tell for only three hours. Well, 187 minutes, which I think is it's one of those numbers, 180, 187. If, if you're a Californian, you know what 187 was in the 80s it was the the law that was passed it would take away all the rights to to immigrants or uh, you know undocumented people that was the and, that was uh ariana huffington i believe that was the 90s when and wasn't it no yeah it was the the mid the mid 90s yeah and but 187 was a cry they were gonna it was the movement in california to take away all those rights and so that's why when 187 minutes i mean this is another number to forever be associated with our democracy you know 187 minutes really the threshold for almost losing what we gained in 1776 so we will see he was watching television and it was uh, riveting in his defense we all we were all watching we it. were all what but he was cheering he was cheering on like no, but i mean like some arsonist, right? Admiring his reflection in the fire he set, right? That that was the thing about Trump. And uh, so, yes, I think you're right. Yeah, it's good that he was watching at least. But you know what? He had the power to do so much more. He had the power. He, I think he got I think he got caught up in it, the drama and yeah. forgot that he could stop it. I think he like I said, he was like he was doing him he was uh this voyeur president and this is what he wanted and he had to be reminded constantly by the people around him uh, shouldn't we put out a statement shouldn't we do this but you know i i know you're going you're we're leading up to the prime time thing but i i get i lead up to it by thinking about certain people and you know because i have an asian american lens because i write for the asian american legal defense and education fund I'm thinking of people like, you know, Stephanie Murphy, Vietnamese American, who is a member of Congress and Chinese American Grace Meng, 
you know, Stephanie Murphy, by the way, is on the committee, on the January 6th committee. Grace Meng from New York, Chinese American. I think of Andy Kim, Korean American, who after all the, the, the drama was in this famous photo that was in the Wall Street Journal, he was sweeping away the debris. You know, so I think of the Asian Americans who were from New Jersey. Andy. Is, yeah, Andy Kim's from New Jersey. He was tormented, or they were they're all like hiding. But I I wrote this column in today. You know, I just want to say something. Yeah. Uh, because I was in the Capitol and, and I saw Andy Kim, Congressman Andy Kim. Congressman Andy Kim. Yes. Who cleaned up yeah. January 6th. And I walked up to him and I said, Congressman, you missed a spot. <laughs> and dutifully. Definitely. He took out his, his broom and he. <laughs> it's, it's funny. You gotta go under the statue of Jefferson Davis. They never get under the uh, statue of Jefferson Davis. That's where all the dust and feces. They're always sweeping it under those big white guys, you know. Hey, so I'm watching. I, I'm th when I think about January 6th, I wrote this in my Alda uh, column this this morning. I think about Michael Fanone. The, the D.C. Metropolitan Police Officer, because, you know, when he was getting brutally attacked and pleading for mercy, people were saying, shoot that guy with a gun, his own gun. What was his response? He says, I have kids that and, and you know, his kids. Four of three of the four of his four kids are Chinese American. So when he was defending democracy, he was also defending diversity. And he right. said, I, I got to take care of my kids. And so I think I think of Fanon, I think of and, you know, when I write a lot of people in some of these communities, you know, they're, they're so busy with their lives. They don't they don't think about, oh, should I watch this? Oh, I'll just catch the highlights on the Feldman show. Yeah. But I and I make huh? well, I make them I, real. I find that interesting. If somebody were beating me to a pulp. Yeah. If I said I have kids, I figure they would want to take me out of my misery and finish me off. I know because you lecture your kids too much. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. You got to lead by example and then get beaten up so that. No, no, I I forget the, the tone of it. Look, the, the thing about uh, Fanon's kids, they represent the new America, you know, and I tell people who are Asian American who are, you know, don't. They may not see themselves in government. Actually, this year, there are more Asian Americans running for office because they see the necessity to be empowered. But I tell people, think of your mothers and your fathers who immigrated here. And why did they why did they come here? You know, because a lot of people are just like, I'm doing my thing They're They've got this tunnel vision. They're going to have their success. But government, it, it's never been a big uh, calling for many Asian Americans, except you know, we say maybe the last 10, 15 years, especially with the the stop AAPI hate movement when Asian Americans are targeted. But you think right. about, you know, Fanon's kids. I mean, three of his four kids are, are Chinese American. And you think about the, the last census, because this is what's really brought us to this division in America. Right. You know, because we've got in the multi-race capital or multi-race uh, category, two or more races, we've gone from 9 million in 2010 to 33.8 million in 2020. That's a 276% increase. Diverse, diversity is working. We're sleeping with each other and the politicians need to recognize this, that America really is coming together. Meanwhile, the whites only group has decreased 8.6%. So what have we seen just within the last week, th this morning on social media, that former Trump aide, uh, Garrett Ziegler, right? Who I was heard the interview. Yeah, he got he's, he, he's, he used the Fifth Amendment, right to remain silent. Then he went online and said, if you, you know, he called January 6th, the hearings, he said the committee was an anti-white campaign. And if you can't see that, your eyes are freaking closed. You know, Trotskyite. Trotskyite. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He went into the whole Bolshevik thing. Yeah. He said they mistook me for a weak Christian. Yeah. He also brought religion. And I believe he referred to the women, the low level, like Cassidy Hutchinson yeah. as, a, as a hoe. 
Right. And a th a th I, and here's one I hadn't heard. A yeah. thought. He called him thought. That a thought. What does that mean? T H O T. I don't know what a thought was. I mean, a thought and a ho. I, I had to look it up in the slang dictionary or something. But and what does it mean? I, well, I didn't look it up because I was look. I was just because I was concentrating on race. He said, oh. he said he was the least racist person. Right. That many of you have ever met. I have no bigotry. I just try to see the world for where it is. But he is extremely sexist. We know he's extremely sexist. Right. Thought means a woman who has many casual sexual encounters. So if you call a woman a thought and a hoe, it's redundant. It's that's just bad English. I think he ought to read E.B. White and yeah. just you know get get a sense of elegance. Miss anyway, Bottoms Hobgoblins. Did you read that as a kid? Uh, which what is that E.B. White? Yeah, I think, yeah, how to write properly. Uh, Stuart Little, Charlotte Swift, you know, that was me. Right. So, uh, but, but look, you know, so this is really the core of why we have these great divisions. So in some ways, seeing Michael Fanon and hearing him say, I got kids, and then, then seeing, in fact, that he's got these three Asian American kids, uh, you know, to the Asian American community, it's one of those things that says, hey, look, this is the democracy that we're trying to save. This is the new America we're trying to save. And what got me about Fanon is that last week when the, you know, the, you know, the, one of the two of the writers were testifying before the committee, one of them, Stephen Ayers, actually tried to apologize mm -hmm. to Fanon. And he was asked, Fanon was asked, uh, did you accept it? And he said, uh, apologies are, are personal. He said, save the apologies. That goes for anyone involved in January 6. But he said, I found the guy, Stephen Ayers, disingenuous. And this is what stopped me in my tracks. He said, in regards to January 6, I'm sorry. I am not anyone's rest stop on the road to redemption. Wow. Which I thought, oh, man, E.B. White would like that sentence, that phrase. It stopped me cold. And I thought of every time someone has tried to apologize to me for something like when I interviewed Vincent Chin's killer in 2012, Ronald Liebens, and he tried to say, look, I essentially apologize for killing Chin, Evans, who never served any time in jail and was essentially acquitted and has never paid the Chin estate any money. He said he was apologizing. And a lot of people in the Asian community criticized me for even talking to Evans, but you know, my my job was just to, not to be the judge of Evans, but to hear him, and then to report it. I'm an opinion journalist, but I when I heard, uh, you know, Fanon's comment, you know, I'm not anyone's rest up on the road to redemption. I just wish I, I knew that line in 2012, and I would have told that to Ronald Evans. I tell it to anyone who's trying to apologize for anything. And looking to me for redemption, I'm not anyone's one of the right. lesser known Bing Cosby and Bob Hope movies, The Road to Redemption. The Road to Rede well, wait a minute, there was a road movie with redemption. Yeah, I like. And it was Hedy. What's her, what's her name? Oh, Dorothy Lamore. Yes, she was. She, she was the road. That, she, was she a, a, a was she a thought or a hoe? No, she was neither. She was neither. But uh, anyway, so I wrote about that, and I I was trying to get Asian Americans riled up about these January 6 hearings because they're in prime time and we're supposed to, this is the wink that, Hey, let, watch this. This is it, you know, and I'm, I'm happy that people are finally getting around. Like there's a new book called American Nero uh, and Nero. Um, I, I, when I first heard or that, that, that Trump was doing nothing, you know, on January 6, Nero instantly came to mind. Get this fans of antiquity. And since many of your listeners are reading uh, the Odyssey, right? So they're fans of antiquity. Uh, they will instantly you like me. If you like my comedy, then you're a fan of antiquity. I know it's so well, you know, we can like freshen it up a bit with some new tags or something. Look, it turned to Nero, who is said to have fiddled as Rome burned. Get this. 64 CE, July 18th. So almost all those hundreds and thousands of years, July 18th, and today's the 21st. It's like the coincidence of it all. 
Isn't that kind of Rome? That happened 64 CE, July 18. And we're all right. fiddling while right. Rome burns. That's when Nero, and you know, there's still some discussion whether no, Nero really fiddled in the classical sense, but uh, I don't know if there was uh, music involved really, but uh, in the broad sense and things that I was reading, uh, Nero was fiddling. Trump, Trump had the, I guess he had music, he had lyrics, hang Mike Pence, that was a good lyric, you know, uh, kill him with his own gun. That's what they said to Fernand, that was a good lyric. Yeah. Hang Mike Pence. That would Hang been, Mike Pence. Yeah. Would have been, I mean, no comment. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, so the San Francisco School Board. Yeah. The, one of the members apologized for making yeah. realizations about people of color and their achievements. What what happened? Well, you know, San Francisco has gone through this. Are we too woke for our own good? And we've got a group of people, conservative Asian Americans mostly who've started recall efforts. They got rid of the DA Ooh. and they got rid of the school board in uh, February and November of last year. Well, one of the replacement school board members, uh, an Asian American, Ann Sue, uh, started talking about brown and black educational achievement. And she made a comment how it's related to being a you know, the, 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 the way their families are and their poverty, and they just don't get the kind of encouragement. And she got, well, first of all, is that a racist statement, David? You tell me. Well, you know, I have made statements like that, but it's usually accompanied with data, like here's some finding from this survey or this report, or, you know, she just made a statement a blanket statement. Even the San Francisco Chronicle had some problems with reporting it until they said, well, yeah, it looks like she is dealing in stereotypes. So it is racist. And so they reported it. Uh, this uh, Ansu had it in uh, in social media. So she got lambasted by everyone who was tight with. They were mad, first of all, that progressives were recalled in November. So she's getting it. And now finally, she apologized yesterday, said, look, uh, I was insensitive. I, and this is the way it should be. You make a mistake. You should be able to apologize and say, I screwed up. I'll do better next time. But we live in an era where everyone wants your head. And, and later yesterday, a, the president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, which is the you know, the political body servicing all of San Francisco, not just education, wanted Ann Sue to resign. So it's not over. I don't know if Ann Sue is going to resign, but it's, you know, we, we just live in this era where it's beyond cancel culture. It's like, hey, you screw up. We want your head. Right. There's no there's no debate, you know. So that's that's what's happening in San Francisco. The. Uh, Maybe too woke for its own good. I don't know. Well, in San Francisco, being woke is what passes for leftism. Nobody is willing to solve homelessness or take on uh, the landlords or Silicon Valley. So they rely on performative wokeness to appear compassionate when... Well People yeah. in San Francisco really need is a place to live. Uh, well, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of times wokeness, uh, performative wokeness is is like, uh, you know, they pass the buck. They say, look, this is what I believe. Now you do it. You know, they want to call someone to take care, you know, to, to mow the lawn. Oh, we talk to me about codifying into law abortion, contraception, uh, same sex marriage, and you say vegans should. Yeah. Law protecting look, us? First of all, look, I'm glad that they're codifying rights. We need to, we need. Well, they're not. It's not going to pass in the Senate. Well, okay. It's not going to pass. So if it's not going to pass, then it's all just an empty exercise. And you, th so use better language. Don't say codify, veganize the language. I think of the fish. I No, I'm serious. I mean, Instead of using a term like kill two birds with one stone, I use a term like feed two birds with one scone. I, if the language is an attitude, 
And so if you use the term codify, it makes me think of fish and maybe pescatarians are all right by that. But I think that if they use more thoughtful language, they could say, take a, uh, uh, a collard green a tortilla idea where you slightly steam the collard green and then you use the leaves and you wrap, you can wrap those old laws and put them into a collard green wrap. And then you veganize the language and that you don't, wouldn't have to use codify. And if it's all moot anyway, because it's not going to happen, then why bring in the poor cods? Right. We have three minutes and 30 seconds before the January 6 hearings begin if you're watching us on youtube and you'd like to sit in our virtual studio audience and enjoy the watch party with us please go to davidfeldmanshow.com right now hit pay-per-view it doesn't cost you anything it'll take you right into our zoom room and then after the hearings we're going to resume the live stream on youtube and on zoom we will take your calls your reactions along with the reverend barry w lynn alan minsky executive director of the progressive democrats of america and the professors in marianne professor marianne cummings professor ann lee and professor jonathan bick we have one minute the all-star game are you happy about the yankees well you know i am because you know they 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 it 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 tears me because I like the Mets more than the Yankees. You probably are a Yankee guy though, right? I, I, I see. I, I like that. The fact they focus on John Carlos Stanton and also on Aaron judge, who's from my neck of the woods in California. He's from Linden, California. That's why he's got the 99 because it's for highway 99. That's good. But they should have given more, more attention to Shohei Otani, who is the best player in baseball better than Babe Ruth bet better than Babe Ruth. And it's funny how a year ago I was talking how some people were xenophobic saying how baseball was hurting itself because it's star marquee player. Shohei Otani doesn't speak English. And wouldn't it be nice? This is Stephen A. Smith on CNN or uh, ESPN said, wouldn't it be nice if they had a white player like Mike Trout as the marquee player of the game? And I, I let him have it for that. But now a year later, Shohei Otani is now seen as the best player in baseball, but still they're, they're reluctant to fully embrace him in the media. Anyway. Hey, David, uh, how many, how many million viewers do you think will be watching tonight? It'll be interesting. I don't think it'll score as high as last, uh, as Cassidy Hutchinson. We have to wrap it up. Emil Guillermo host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Read them over at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and follow me on Twitter at Emil Amok. How do they watch your live stream? Very quickly, please. They can see it on uh, facebook.com slash emilgolermo.media or amok.com. All right, we have 30 seconds before, thank you, Emil, we have 30 seconds before we start watching the January 6th Select Committee hearings. If you would like to join us, go to my website, hit pay-per-view, it'll take, us, take you into our virtual studio audience, join the conversation. If you're watching us on YouTube, we will be back with another live stream, a wrap-up to discuss the January 6th, tonight's January 6th hearings. We'll see you in about two hours. How do you, uh, how do I shut this down? We have to have a meet. I have to start having meetings here. These Dan, you're the host. Dan. Okay. I can't shut down the live stream. All right. This is uh